Welcome to 132 Problems Revisiting Mormon Polygamy. I am so excited to bring you this conversation I was able to have in this episode. This is another one where I invited someone on who does not see eye to eye with me, but I thought that this was a great conversation. I'm so happy that John Hamer agreed to come on and talk to me. I'm really happy with how the conversation went and with how it ended. I always love when there are good feelings afterward, and I think we accomplished that in this discussion. So I'll be really um, eager to hear people's thoughts after listening to this another long episode. But those of you who have been with me for a while know I always do recommend listening to these episodes in order from the beginning so you can understand the journey that we've been on and the things that we've already covered. For those who are here for the first time, welcome. Feel free to start here as well. And as always, I want to thank those who have been so generous and helpful to donate to this podcast. And I would invite anybody else to as well if you feel so inclined and able. I really appreciate it. So thank you so much for be being here as we take this deep dive into the murky waters of Joseph's polygamy. Welcome to this episode. I am actually really excited to have this conversation with my new friend, John Hamer, who I'm just meeting for the first time. And um, a, a listener, I think actually a critical listener, sent me one of John's recent um, presentations, um, lectures that he gave, sort of to challenge me. And I found it very insightful to watch and interesting. And I reached out to John and asked if he'd be willing to come talk to me about it. And Thank you so much, John, for being willing to say yes. That was really impressive to me. I always like when people are willing to um, have conversations and kind of back up their words. So I appreciated that. So a quick introduction, John it, John Hamer, um, he has a very extensive resume in the community of Christ and the broader Mormon, and I would say probably post-Mormon community. That's where I've seen you the most, John. Um, he has a very interesting religious story that I'm really looking forward to finding out more about. He was raised LDS, but began doubting um, the church and left as a teen. And in what seems to me a fascinating turn of events 10 years ago or so um joined the community of christ that, that used to be the rlds church now the community of christ and he's been serving I, it seems very faithfully in that church he's now a 70 and he's the pastor which i believe is similar to a bishop in our tradition he's the pastor of the church's toronto congregation and also i believe has a very large online ministry if i understood that correctly john and um and I, I will not be able to include everything, but I know that he writes and edits books. He speaks often. He blogs. He makes maps. He's a cartographer. He studies history. He runs organizations. He gives many online presentations. And I really did appreciate your um, presentation on schisms and Mormonism. I know there have been many others that you've done, but he has a lot of information. And lucky for us, he also comes on podcasts. So <laughs> welcome, John Hamer. Thank you thank so you. much for being here. Well, thank you for that introduction. And, um, I'm happy to be here. Good. I'm happy well, to meet I really you, Michelle. appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I wanted us to spend a little bit of time. Maybe I, I know we have so much to get into, so much to talk about. I um, have sent your presentation to my listeners. So hopefully some of them already have gained um, that information. The two presentations I watched on Joseph's, oh, okay. Joseph's polygamy and on Joseph Smith III. So so hopefully they should be up to date on some of those um some of those discussion points. And anyone that is watching, if you would like to um, pause here and go ahead and watch John's presentations first, feel free to do that. They're linked in the description box. And then you will be able to come back and be a little more informed about the discussion. Not necessary, but also, I think as we go through, John, if we're able to refer to that, I can give timestamps so people can go watch the portion that we're talking about as well. So, okay. um, so anyway, I'm I'm really happy to be able to talk to you. So I know we can't spend long on it because we have so much to discuss, but would you be willing to share a little bit of your faith journey? I just find that fascinating. What um, specifically, I guess you can share whatever you'd like, but I'd like to know what reached back out to you and drew you to the community of Christ and kind of how your process has gone. Sure. Um, so I... Uh... Like you say, I have a long roots in the tradition. So my ancestors joined uh, back 
uh, in 1832, 1833, the winter of that, and moved to Kirtland and helped build the Kirtland Temple. So we've had that whole long legacy. Uh, and I grew up Mormon, um, but uh, became a doubting teenager over um, both a bunch of the different faith claims. And so things like historicity of the Book of Abraham, Book of Mormon, that sort of thing. But actually, the uh, breaking point for me was uh, uh, sexism. In the church so i just did not think that um uh it i didn't agree with the position that only men should be in priesthood and that women shouldn't um, uh, be able to share their giftedness in that same way uh and so was that uh, that's back in the 70s was that back in the 70s <laughs> yeah well i mean i i'm not that old <laughs> so oh, I'm, so, I'm so sorry yeah, it's okay. i'm sorry when you you were Born in the 70s. So I was born in 1970. So yeah, so no, I was definitely an active LDS in the 70s. I left when I became an adult. And so that was uh, in, in, that. in 88. Too it's far. all right. <laughs> okay. I just so all... I just was thinking how progressive you were already. That's very forward thinking for a kid, oh. the, a Mormon kid in the Midwest to be aware of that. That's anyway. Well, that's... maybe so. I, I, I don't know. I feel like this was also, uh, this was a time. So the 70s was a time when I was growing up as a time when the Equal Rights Amendment was around. And uh, and so definitely um, we were, I, I think we were very much in favor of all, all of that kind of equality. And so I was very uncomfortable as a child with the um, uh, the racist exclusion policy, you know, in terms of yes. priesthood and the temple and all that sort of thing. Um, and unfortunately, I was also, and I was very comfortable, even though that Paul, I was happy that that was lifted and uh, when I was a child again, but as a teenager going to seminary, um, I was nevertheless taught uh, by our seminary teachers the same kind of, um, you know, racist preexistence doctrine or whatever as doctrine. It's not necessarily doctrine, but whatever the, the lore that went behind that. And so I was also um, turned off by that in terms of uh, being in the church. And so ultimately, that's what just kind of led me to leave. I was uh, um, attracted all, already into history. And so um, I went off and pursued my graduate studies in the University of Michigan uh, and just left my entire Mormon identity behind. I started focusing on medieval history, but also ancient and classical history. And, um, and it was only much later um, that I came back and found the movement when I started doing uh, some of my own family history. And so, like I say, since my family history is all tied up uh, with the restoration, um, I actually went back and re-explored uh, Mormon history. So I had only been raised as a kid reading LDS history manuals and so forth, things that had been approved by the church. And uh, the church had a policy very much, the LDS church had a policy at that time of um, a lot of whitewashing and denying of its history and the manuals were made to be especially boring and so i just assumed that uh mormon history was just intensely boring <laughs> and so i went to um i mean Isn't I went that to, sad yeah i think yeah. i probably felt the same way that's yeah. tragic it was tragic you know not. and so i, I mean i love here's a kid who loves loves history <laughs> you know and so and i and i was having the struggles over my faith and I tried to get into it through the history. And so I went to Nauvoo when I was 13. And it was just an amazing for me to experience this place where, you know, my ancestors had lived, where they'd had, you know, their house and all this kind of thing as they were trying to build like a perfect society and community. And, you know, they, I, I dreamed of wanting to, I had, I had, when I was on my paper out, I had dreams of how I could create, like how we could make a replica Nauvoo temple and put it back, you know, and get it rebuilt, you know, and so how, how exciting when it actually did have a, replica Nabu temple got built eventually. And, um, wow. and yet, and yet, and I went home and I built Nabu out of Legos. <laughs> so, you know, in other words, I have like my entire, That's you know, this great. entire giant, uh, city of Nabu out of like, because I was so interested in that. But unfortunately, um, again, I couldn't find anything to sink my teeth into the, um, the only thing out of, uh, the church history, uh, that I remember being remotely interested in uh, that I can even remember when from early morning seminary is uh, the one lesson where they actually mentioned that not everybody went West, that there had, were these other churches, there were the Strangites and these other groups. And, that, and I was like, wow, 
that's interesting. What, what is that about? You know? And so uh, it was when then I started doing that family history, I started going around uh, the Midwest and visiting church history sites. That's when I really started to encounter all of the smaller churches. And it was on my uh, 30th birthday when I went to the Kirtland Temple for the very first time that I met members of Community of Christ. And so then um, from that, I started also getting involved in the um, church history community. And so I started uh, 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 attending the Mormon History Association meetings and the John Whitmer Historical Association meetings. Uh, and I also, because like you mentioned, I am uh, have a background in history and also in um, map making. I uh, very early on uh, did a project where I mapped all of the um, settlement of Caldwell County, which was the Latter-day Saint County in Missouri at the time of the 1838 Mormon Missouri War. And so I showed up to my first JWHA um, with a map of that that was like seven feet long that showed every single piece of property that everybody owned. And so all wow. of these um, historians whose books I'd read, <laughs> you know, uh, like Steve Lesware, the guy who wrote, you know, the 1838 Mormon uh, War in Missouri, um, like Jan Ships, you know, like, uh, you know, all, all of these other just great historians who were there, they're all like, who's this guy? Who's this guy? <laughs> sure. And so, yeah, um, you just illustrated and, their their work. They got to see yeah. it in, in Matt. And, so, and so that was nice okay. for me because I had a nice foray into it right away. And so um, at that very first conference, even uh, Jan Ship mm -hmm. said uh, to me, you know, I am the incoming president of this association, and I would love for you to serve on my my program committee. And that just kind of brought me directly into uh, John Whitmer, uh, which is the Community of Christ version of the Mormon History Association. And within a couple of years, uh, my husband and I, Mike, uh, were made the directors of the association. And uh, over time, oh, together, both of you yeah, together, together okay. we became the directors okay. of it. And then. Um, and later when we retired from that and passed that on, I became the president of the association. But usually it's an annual, a historian is the president each year uh, elected annually. And um, um, anyway, in the, in the course of that, I got to know members of Community of Christ very well. And over time, uh, at first I, I, I felt that uh, the, the church had made all of these changes that were the kinds of things that post-Mormons, or, or liberal Mormons even also, are constantly complaining about their the LDS church. And I sort yes. of was kind of listening to them. The internet had just barely started, and, and I was uh, meeting other former Mormons or inactive Mormons, post-Mormons or liberal Mormons on, on bulletin boards and things like that. And, uh, and so I was kind of always kind of saying, you guys want all of these things, <laughs> and this church over here has all these things. Uh, maybe maybe some of you should start joining this other church because it's already done all the things that you want and your church is never going to do those things, no matter how much uh, the the liberal Mormon um, fever dream is that it's just around the corner that, all, all, you know, women's ordination, all these things are going to happen. They're not going to happen. And, uh, and, okay. and I'm sorry to say that. I said that all the way back when I left the church in, you know, you know, you know in, it's in, definitely. In, a, yeah. Yeah. It's well, I don't want to I don't want to alienate. I mean. I, I'm I'm up in the air about what should happen, what shouldn't happen, because I'm an active member. But yes, I yeah. but I hear you. I know that a lot of people do. A lot of people do leave the LDS Church and go to the Community of Christ, seeing it as a good next step. I think that that's quite common. So I, and I and that's what I tried to saying. get people to have that as an idea, right? So it really was mm -hmm. hardly an idea twenty years ago when I started um, promoting that among uh, liberal Mormons and and oh, so, so forth. Oh, so that's been you. That's been you that's made that that's, movement. I've that's helped good build that bridge. It's not only me, but it's, I've been okay. certainly one of the people who pioneered that. So I kind of like to say that at a certain point, um, you know, there's a bunch of, let's say, liberal um, Americans who say, if so and such and such happens, get, gets elected president again or something like that, I'm moving to Canada. <laughs> you know? Right. And, and uh, Americans say that I was all there. the time. I was there yeah. for a certain election. <laughs> I couldn't see either way I could stay with either candidate. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So it, it actually, it happens both ways. I said liberal, but actually it, people say they're moving to Canada either way. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. one way or the other. And, uh, and in this particular case, then we started getting that to the point, well, you know, 
people now got to say, you know, started saying, well, if this or this, the November policy, I'm joining Community of Christ or something like that, right? And so that became kind of a, a, an awareness that is now, made, I think, kind of there and that has now started happening. So there's actually, yes, lots and lots of um, wonderful um, member, former members of the LDS Church uh, have all joined Community of Christ, and I'm very happy with what they're doing and how they're able to be doing um, uh, having their having their voice heard, they're empowered. They're able to, to do ministry that they just wouldn't be welcome in the LDS Church because the LDS okay. Church is so um, intensely programmed. Uh, you know, so that everybody is on the same page. You have your manuals. You're supposed to be, um, you know, doing this particular thing on this particular Sunday, and everybody all around the world has the same formula and that kind of a thing, which is a under a a way to do a church. <laughs> and so community of Christ is a very different way to do a church, you know, so the kind of uh, pre-correlation uh, style Latter-day Saintism where uh, essentially the individual congregations, like this is my congregation here, I'm coming to you from the uh, the church in downtown Toronto, Toronto center place of our, uh, the Toronto congregation. And we are, you know, really free and at liberty to do all kinds of stuff uh, as a as a congregation um, that it's just it just would be inconceivable for the LDS church so for example we are a um, uh, incorporated as a charity it is a it's a subordinate charity to the the national church in Canada but as a charity we're able to do all kinds of our own you know our own things our own budget elect our own officers our own priorities, um, deciding uh, what we're what we're going to focus on, and so forth. So, for example, as you mentioned, one of our major programs has been to uh, have an online ministry, which has has now become the Community of Christ's largest online ministry. Okay, okay. Is that Center Point? Is it is it Center Point? Is, center is Place. Doing that? Center Place. I'm sorry, Center Place. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's just like in the um, okay, so in the Revelation. Uh, you know, the, the, the place of the city of Zion is, you know, at a spot in, in independence, not close, you know, very close to the border or whatever. And the, and the, the spot for the temple is at, you know, near the center place or whatever. This is kind of, you know, th that, that particular revelation from the DNC. So we're playing off of that when we named, when we named our building here in downtown Toronto, the center place for the Toronto congregation. Okay. Okay, that's nice. Okay, so I, I want to I don't want to spend too much time on all of this, but I am I did a, um, a discussion with a just lovely couple from the restoration branches of the yes. um, that broke off from the RLDS church. Yes. And um, and then I got a little bit of pushback from some members of Community of Christ based on. So I so I want to be do a fair representation of the Community of Christ. So let me just ask you a few questions about the community of Christ, my understanding, and you can tell me if that's accurate. So sure. my understanding is, is there's not, you know, there's kind of a fine line. Like, like you said, the LDS church is very much, um, what's the, I can't think of the Correlated. word, like franchised in a way, like yeah. it's, it's very coordinated. We all do the same things, you know, and then there's a spectrum and it seems like the community of Christ is very much on the other side of the spectrum where there aren't even standardized beliefs and ideas. Like, it seems that you can, you know, like some people in the um, community of Christ do hold the Book of Mormon to be the word of God and, a, and scripture and other people very much do not. And some people hold Joseph Smith to have been a prophet and some hold him to have been maybe it seems to me a larger portion hold him to be have been a bit of a charlatan more than that. Am I understanding that correctly? Like there's a broad range of beliefs. So so we're non-creedal which means that we don't have a, um, you don't have to, in order to join the church, say, um, uh, like the, for example, the Nicene Creed, I believe in one God in three parts yeah, and right. so forth, all that kind of thing. Uh, and so that, but that doesn't mean that we don't uphold uh, a set of basic beliefs. So community of Christ okay. as a church has, uh, upholds a set of, it's even called the basic beliefs. And it also has other other. Um, we also uphold other documents that are sort of like that, and so those include things like our mission initiatives. So we all share uh, five mission initiatives, and we have nine enduring principles, enduring principles of the restored gospel. Um, but we are not. We're we're especially not legalistic, and so when literalistic, and so in a lot of these cases, um, we're interpreting both in terms of the, the 
uh, description of the, the basic beliefs, but also in our, our mission initiatives and principles, we are interpreting the spirit of all of those as opposed to, let's say, literalistic and legalistic uh, interpretation of that. And so, for example, then we wouldn't have, I mean, actually, I would even say, go back and going back to, let's say, the, doctor, uh, the, uh, the word of wisdom. Uh, I would say if you were actually were being legalistic about it and literalistic, you would, you would actually read it and it would say, this is a word of wisdom, not a, by way of commandment or constraint, you know? Right. And, so, and we should all be and, drinking beer. Yes. And we should all be drinking beer and all that. Kind of, so in other words, so it's not, it's not, it's, it's interpreted legalistically, not literalistically in the LDS church. And, and as you probably know the history okay. of that, which is that it became uh, a, a test of faith in the 20th century, early 20th century, after the LDS church abandoned polygamy and needed some identity markers and so forth. Um, and so, um, you know, like I mentioned Jan Ships, when uh, she was always tells in her first RLDS story when she met uh, Bob Flanders, one of the great old um, historians of the RLDS church, her first RLDS person that she'd ever met, she'd, she'd had this experience, um, you know, like being a, a, a teacher and so forth in Logan. So kind of like uh, old timey, you know, LDS times and, the, and and so forth. And so she's at this conference, and Bob Flanders sits down with a with a a, a mug of coffee, and she just looks at it like a like a Mormon would, like, oh my God, you brought the devil to you know to this table. And then Bob Flanders notices that, and he looks at her, and he says, and he says to her, "You'll notice that I, I let coffee get cold before I drink it." <laughs> <laughs> You know. <laughs> That's great. As I'm but, drinking my herbal tea, it's now yeah. cold, so I'm fine too. <laughs> exactly. So, so what I would just say about That's that is that, so yeah, there are members of Community of Christ. I've got a great friend, um, Ron Romig, who is the former archivist of the church. He baptized me. So he, um, his interpretation of the word of wisdom is that you shouldn't uh, drink alcohol and coffee and tea and so forth. And he doesn't drink coffee, you know, and so... And he's a member of the church and that's his interpretation of it. And I think that that's, you know, great. You know, um, my interpretation of the word of wisdom is that we should look to what um, contemporary science is telling us, you know, so there was a, there were folk concerns in this particular case about hot drinks and so forth at the time. Uh, and that we should, and then in general, we should be following a principle of doing things that are healthy and, and, doing things in moderation and so forth. And so I consider that to be a, um, I consider that to be words of wisdom still that are, that are appropriate and that informs my, my own spiritual practice and life. Right. So not trying, trying not okay. to, um, uh, do things that are immoderate and therefore unhealthy and, and so forth. Uh, but I don't consider it like this, um, you know, one drop of alcohol or, or drinking a, a caffeinated Coke or whatever it would be, you know, in other words, this sort of uh, uh, um, hard sure. rules thing, but rather spirit of thing. And I would say that that's in general how, how things are going. So in terms of you're talking about Book of Mormon as scripture, Book of Mormon is scripture in community of Christ. So that is part of our canon of scripture. So um, um, not the Pearl of Great Price, because the Pearl of Great Price is actually a, uh, a compilation or pamphlet that was put together in in England by the Brighamite church many decades after um, the church is split apart. So that's not part of our canon, but our canon is uh, the Bible, Old and New Testament, and then uh, the Book of Mormon, and then the Doctrine and Covenants. And we have uh, the shared sections that are from uh, the Nauvoo period, up through the Nauvoo period. Then the LDS church uh, added a whole bunch of other sections that are based on Joseph Smith material in the late 19th century. That's not part of our Doctrine and Covenants, but every subsequent... So, so you don't have section 132 anywhere as any... I know that our, right. our sections yeah. diverge. Yeah. So yes. do you still have the traditional section 101? You do as 124, yes. I believe. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. So that's a... That, like, it's kind of fun to see the differences between our two doctrines and covenants. That's a fun exercise right. if anyone wants to do that. Yeah, so mm -hmm. DNC 132, like you say, so this is a, um, the document dates to Nauvoo, but it was not presented to the church openly in Nauvoo. Um, it was presented privately, secretly to the high council and so forth, the presiding high council, but it was not, um, uh, it was not brought before a church vote. And so our understanding of what becomes scripture in community of Christ is uh, a prophet like um and we recognize Joseph Smith Jr. as our founding prophet, the first prophet of the church of community of Christ. 
um, a prophet, uh, uh, the, what, what prophet's calling is to bring inspired counsel to the body of the church, the body of the church then meeting in a, what you call originally a general conference, what we now call a world conference. Um, all of the delegates to that conference are called upon to be prophetic people and to discern whether uh, God is calling uh, us to add that to our canon of scripture. And so I have been a delegate uh, to the World Conference before while we we're considering adding inspired counsel to the scriptures. And when that happens, then then that becomes scripture. And so, uh, okay. and so, and so that's how, so, so when you're talking about understanding the Book of Mormon as scripture or not, we understand it as scripture but people can understand each individual book or text of scripture in different ways than let's say the more, let's say literalistic way. I think that it, scripture is usually understood in, in the LDS tradition. Okay, so a couple of questions, um, just quick like trivia things. Are delegates elected by congregations? Is that how the delegates to the World yes. Conference works? So specifically okay. though, um, so my congregation will send delegates to our our what we the mission level, which is like um, um, a district or something like that in the LDS tradition. So I'm trying to think of like a, if all the stakes are make up a district or an area or region or something like that. So uh -huh. um, so Eastern Canada is a mission center, and so there's about 43 congregations, including mine, and we elect delegates to that conference, and we're going to have our conference in a couple weeks here. And then the conference, the conference, the Eastern Canada conference elects delegates to the world conference. So yes, it's elected. Okay. Okay. I'm so elected it's really too interesting pastor, because it feels, way. oh, you're elected as pastor. Yeah. Okay. Every year we have an election. So, and so, um, and so it is not like, um, the LDS tradition where, uh, the pastors or the bishops or whatever are appointed from above, but rather the congregation itself elects its own pastor. Okay. That's so interesting. See, it's so interesting because like religion is tricky, right? I mean, I think the LDS has very much gone to the side of sort of, I hate to use the word authoritarianism, but authoritarianism, you know, like that was kind of the Brighamite tradition. And the community of Christ seems to be almost in some ways, like to my LDS eyes, it looks more like a political organization in a lot of ways. I know that the, like the church became very, you know, liberal politically, and and it's mostly involved in sort of political movements, not in terms of electing the president, but you know, like it, it has a political cause feel to it, yeah. and a political um, way of so so it's kind of it's I I don't I don't know that there's a right or wrong. It's interesting to consider the differences, you, you know, yeah. and so. I mean, I it's hard not to make the analogy, right? So the analogy is when you take an organization, so we have a religious, these are two churches, right? So they're religious organizations and operating, uh, you know, hopefully on faith and so forth. And, and, and with, uh, uh, right, you know, in good intent on, on the fact, on the part participants and the adherents. And I think that that's largely the case for all the members and in, in these, in these groups. Um, but then when you make an analogy to a government, which is different. So then, like you say, the one of them will look like, um, you know, some kind of an authoritarian oligarchy that is passed on yeah. by seniority or something like that through self-appointment. And the other one looks like a democracy where, and, and, and with all the problems of democracy, which is to say that you would have factions and what can be political parties. And when you, um, and when you specifically Campaign. talk to, um, uh, for example, you, you know, wonderful folks who are, like you say, restorationists, people who um, parted ways with the main line of the church, maybe in the 80s. Um, it it felt, especially at that time period, like there were political factions and one whole faction decided that they couldn't be part of the of the body anymore. Right. And um, mm -hmm. and, that, and unfortunately, that caused a lot of uh, 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 hurt on both sides, the way that all went down. And, and um, and I, I, I wasn't a member of Community of Christ at that time, but I have subsequently been, you know, a pastor within the tradition. And so um, I can say that one one um, one blessing that we've had in my congregation is that um, by having our online ministry, by by reaching out, by having our services on online every Sunday, people have been able to watch without having the barrier to entry of having to go in a what is an alien church that you're scared of maybe or mad at or angry about. And so there have actually been um, a large number of um, 
people who become restorationists at certain points and for whom maybe that wasn't as their objections weren't as strong anymore. They're in the pandemic. They start watching our services and they have rejoined uh, the church, but being by being a member of the Toronto congregation. So that is another distinction between the um, community of Christ and the LDS church In the LDS church, based on where you live geographically, you are assigned a congregation or a ward in community of Christ. Again, it's a um, self-directed. So the individual member can decide any congregation they want to have their membership with anywhere on the planet. <laughs> so, so, and, and so in fact, okay. actually one of the times the recorder, the world church recorder, um, will just give us notices that, oh, these people are now members of your congregation, you know? And so I'm like, oh, I've never heard of them okay. before. So now we have to reach out to, you know, we reach out to them, you know, these folks in Michigan or these other folks that are in Arizona or so forth are now part of the Toronto, Canada um, congregation. And so, and so our, actually our congregation, because of uh, movement online, uh, the majority of the, the members actually don't live within driving distance anymore of this um, church facility, so. Well, that's interesting. That makes it a very different thing than the, like I said in our, you know, when I was introducing myself, I serve in the nursery, you know, yeah, yeah. you can't serve in the nursery when you're not meeting. So it's, it's a very, yes. that, that's, that's, it's a very different feel, I guess, kind of continuing on from when we had the shutdown. So, yes. okay, well, thank you for giving that um, overall explanation. I think, I think like one of the things I've learned, I think that since um, maybe this is the reason, but, but since many people who are disaffected from the LDS church tend to go into the community of Christ, what I've, what I've been told is that the Salt Lake community of Christ tends to have a little bit more of an anti-Joseph. Like I've been told you shouldn't judge the whole community of Christ by the flavor in Utah, where, where there maybe is a little bit more, um, more free dismissiveness and criticism of say Joseph Smith. And, you know, cause that's one of the, discussion points is um people who anyway well so so people can be people. anywhere so when i'm saying he is uh, the founding prophet of the church that doesn't mean you have to have so again we don't have this um perspective on prophets that that prophets are are perfect or that prophets are directly talking to god the way um god talk the way we talk to other people god doesn't talk that way and so um and so instead what we're talking about is Everybody, we're we're all called to be prophetic people. Everybody in the tradition is um, called to ha receive personal revelation and so forth. The difference for the prophet is that they have an additional calling, which is to bring inspired counsel to the church, and then the church decides whether or not it it's going to become scripture. But uh, but but okay. that doesn't mean that they are perfect in their in their personal lives. And so people in community of Christ are all over the place and everywhere all over the place. And so. Um, and so people have had to come to terms with uh, with what we call the new Mormon history, right? And so up until um, up until the middle of the 20th century, when Von Brody wrote, uh, you know, her biography, "No Man Knows My History," no man knows my history. Um, there really had been almost no um, there had been almost no actual like historians who'd done uh, surveys of the movement. And so a uh, lots of um, not trained historians anyway. And so there had been um, uh, in the LDS church, what we call, you know, you have church historians, but, and we had church historians in the RLDS church, uh, but these are not people who were trained in the academic discipline of history. And so they're really what we would probably call antiquarians, um, which is to say oh, they, they are collecting. Apologists. Well, or apologists oh. too. And so, and so, you know, in other words, they're collecting, um, old stuff and they're combining it together. Um, and, uh, and then, and then, and they're telling the story as they understand it and, and so forth. And, um, and, and in general, those, none of those, mostly those folks, <laughs> that's, I'm not going to say none, mostly those folks are, are, are coming from a position of, of earnestness and they're telling it like, um, they believe it. And so, so in general, we're, people are not being, um, uh, on, you know, uh, deliberately deceitful. And so, uh, and that, and that starts to change, um, when 
so when there's a huge transformation in in all of North American society at the end of World War II, when when suddenly you know the GIs come home, they're uh, they're sent to colleges on the GI Bill and so forth, and suddenly you go from a population where um, whatever it would have been three percent or something like that of the population had a college degree to where we are now, where you know it's a, it's like three quarters or something like that and and so as a result of that that changes um the number of people for example who have had uh training for example in the academic discipline of history and that's where we get for the very first time i mentioned jan ships um and bob flanders you know meeting at the beginning of the um the organization of the mormon history association which is which happens at that same time period you know the late 60s the early 70s John Whitmer is that that old as well. So suddenly you have people who are trained in this. And when that happens, then you suddenly have actual history as opposed to uh -huh. antiquarian memory and, and sacred story that had had developed, you know, and, okay. and unfortunately, um, people weren't equipped for it. And the early historians, um, because they were encountering uh, such an entrenched vision of a sacred story, an identity myth that people that we had built up both in the RLDS church and in the LDS church because of those identity myths that are so central to how we understand ourselves, because those are kind of rooted in the past, what we understand to be history, but not, but not academic history. <laughs> then unfortunately those were um, susceptible to the actual, uh, the actual work of academic historians who unfortunately tended to, be debunkers as, as a result, you know? And so Von Brody okay. is not writing her, her biography as a, um, with a pastoral care to the Mormon people, you sure. know? So, it, you know, you know, sure. it's, okay. it's, yeah. Okay. That makes, so, okay. There are so many, so many things I want to talk about. So I guess, okay. um, we can start with a couple of points of agreement that I think that we have. And then I do want to talk a little bit, just going a little bit to the historian's craft, because I yes. think that's an interesting discussion to have. And then, and then maybe we can go on to talking specifically about Joseph's polygamy. And so, okay. so one thing I think that we do agree on that, um, that you mentioned is that we both think 132 for the most part is quite deplorable and that polygamy yes. as a whole is awful and was never of God. Right. So I absolutely, <laughs> I so definitely that's, agree with that. Okay. So I, I like that. I like that there were some things that we agreed on. And then as I was watching your presentations, <laughs> um, a couple of other things that we agree on is I think you did acknowledge that, um, contemporary evidence is important to establish the truth of stories. And, and I think agree that contemporary evidence um, is high, more highly prioritized than later right. reminiscences in general. Absolutely. And um, especially if there's um, logical problems with the story, like you use the example of the the women breaking up their china to put in on the, in the, on the Kirtland Temple. And those are nice later reminiscences, but they're right. not historically accurate for several reasons, right? And because- And, it, and it's sad that, that, about that, because, because, <laughs> because everyone loves the Kirtland Temple china story. I actually loved hearing it wasn't true. They were already so poor and why break china? Like you said, yes. they're like, put some shards of metal in it, <laughs> some shards of glass. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, no, I mean, that's the idea. I think the, the truth of that story is that they sacrificed everything to build that. And yes. they sacrificed so much that they they literally went bankrupt and they they lost everything. And they had to I mean, Joseph and his he had to flee Ohio for for debts and so forth. And um, and that's certainly true. So my my great 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 grandparents, like I said, who were uh, who helped build it, they they uh, were loyalists. And so they moved uh, to far west with um, with Joseph and Sydney. And okay. um, anyway, and so they lost everything too. They had to start all over again, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, so that was just an example of, like the, the point I wanted to make was that contemporary evidence, I agree, is much more, um, That's right. is, is very important when we're trying to seek historical truth. And, and then um, I've really liked this quote. You said, nor should historians have conclusion driven conclusion driven apologetics where one starts with the conclusion first and then cherry picks the evidence to insist that because something is impossible to disprove it might have happened and um i think that that is so accurate and what's interesting is as i've gone on this journey because you know two years ago i very less than two years ago i very much believed that joseph was 
the originator of polygamy. And I very much don't believe that anymore. And so Mm -hmm. it's interesting to come to it from this direction and see what seems to be that happening on the other side at this point. That's that's been my perspective. So that's why I really wanted to talk about it. And another thing that I like that you said is primary contemporary accounts. I guess this is my summation of what you said. I'm not (laughs) quoting you. Primary contemporary accounts should be prioritized over later accounts and that we need to take into consideration bias and motive when we're evaluating accounts. And and, And then what I wanted to add that I think you would agree with is that if we do have any elements of sort of tangible, like tangible proof, hard physical evidence, that should be very high priority because that's not subject to fraud or bias or anything like that. And then, and then I think that that should include things like when we can show a pattern of bias, forgery, falsehood, you know, that that should play sure. into yeah. it. And I think we should also consider lack of evidence when we would very much expect to find evidence, especially when we do find it in the, in, in very similar situations with other people. Those are, right. those so, are ne- so like negative that evidence is like you're saying. So even when you have negative evidence is still evidence. So for example, um, when we are evaluating, let's say the, the Christmas story that exists in the gospel of Matthew. Right. So Matthew, uh, in creating that account, uh, tells the story that Herod the Great massacres all of the children in the area around Bethlehem. Uh, and, 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 where there's no evidence of that in any other source. It's only it's a, the only found in Matthew that is not found in any other Christian source, any other source. And unfortunately, that story, you know, and it was just a huge thing to have happened. You know, you're killing all hundreds at least of kids, right? And um, and what we do have, unfortunately, so the, why this is ne- why I'm using this as an example of negative evidence. We have um, a very detailed, uh, unusually detailed accounts of. Um, that kind of time period in Judea, Palestine, because of the work of Josephus, who wrote mm-hmm. such an elaborate history of, uh, including the Herod the Great time period, and mm-hmm. is no fan of Herod the Great. So, so he is very, very eager to tell all kinds of um, rotten stories about Herod. So it's not a propagandist for Herod who would be, um, who would be hiding that kind of a thing. And so historians uh, are all pretty universally agreed. They're, um, I would say, all non-apologetic historians. So again, whenever you're getting to things about uh, about religion, unfortunately, there are a whole bunch yeah. of, um, let's say, sc- people who are who are accredited scholars who are, let's say, Christian who are trying to um, who would who would like to have as much of the gospel account be real as possible who might argue in favor of that because all we're talking about in this case we're just talking about negative evidence right but the negative evidence is pretty overwhelming in that case that if that had happened we would have some kind of confirmation somewhere and and instead what we can say is the author of matthew is attempting to um, craft that gospel in order to make it mirror the Torah to make it mirror the five mm-hmm. books of, of Moses and and what and how is how is Moses you know the Moses story uh, you know again begins with a massacre of innocents uh, as Moses is put that's, upon the river. Okay, I, that, I I hadn't studied that one, so that's really interesting. I think that's a great that's a perfect example of what we're talking yeah. about. You if you if you don't find evidence that you should find then you can hold something in in sus, something becomes more suspect than it would otherwise be and i do right. want to say also i just have to push back a little bit on saying that it's religious historians i just think it's people because i think it's about belief and i think that belief goes way beyond religion often yeah, there yeah. are scientific no, beliefs that people argue that you know like like evidence is different than belief and it shows up everywhere so i have to cut the the religious people a little well slack. i'm just going to say it's i mean it's not it's not just them. I'm just saying in that particular case, that's where you can yeah, see an sure. agenda but behind some of those guys. Um, but, yeah. but but I agree with you that it doesn't it does not only religious at all, because actually one of my major um, one of the major people that I end up arguing with, uh, 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 because I, I do, I also have studied a lot the um, the historical Jesus. Right. And so okay. there is a. Um, all historians of the historical Jesus agree that there was a historical Jesus. 
So that is a, okay. um, we have sufficient evidence that everyone who has looked into this question with one exception. <laughs> so, so here's the problem. Okay. So in other words, so there is a guy who is accredited. In other words, he's got a, you know, a degree, a PhD and so forth. And he um, is a promoter on YouTube of the idea that Jesus didn't exist. It's a myth that people later made up. And it is a very popular thing for what I would say, it's a bunch of post-Christians um, would like everything to be a total fraud or something like that. And so and so they, they get it in their head and they think, oh, that's a great idea. I want to believe that. And it sounds very compelling as he's saying all those things. Um, and so and, and so I personally, he's not religious, he's an atheist now. You know, in other words, I, I personally also see that in this particular case that the only way you could come to this conclusion is that it's agenda driven. Um, in other words, an apologetic okay. position, because it is so clearly not, we have the evidence there's, you know, that's just, it's not, you can't draw this conclusion um, uh, from the historical evidence, you know, that there was no Jesus. Okay, so. thanks for making, <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good example of it. So yeah, that's, it's, so, okay, so moving forward, I think the place where we disagree is mm -hmm. that from what I understand, um, I, I like I have now come to believe that Joseph Smith actually was not the originator of polygamy and was not involved in it. And I, it seems to me that you think that that is not a reasonable um, that it, it's not reasonable to conclude that based on the evidence. And so so that's well, what, what, I, what I think would be an interesting. Did, did I say that accurately? No, no, no. Yeah. Well, I'm just, not only just not reasonable, but I'm just saying that all historians who have looked at it. So there's a total historical consensus. In other words, historians have weighed in on this and Joseph Smith is the originator or in the minimum, Joseph Smith is participating in polygamy, even if you, so originator, you know, we, we, there may be, be some wiggle room on that. But, and so, so for example, when I'm talking about the um, existence of Jesus as a historical figure, that doesn't bring in onto it. Did he walk on water or all that kind of thing? That is not, that's not the question, you know, but just the existence sure, right. that is a hundred percent where, you know, not hundred percent, but anyway, all, all historians of the question, um, think the myth of this position is a joke. And so in this particular okay. case, the evidence for Joseph Smith's participation in polygamy in Nauvoo is uh, is so overwhelming that all all historians are agreed about it. And so and so that's what that's what I'm arguing. And so there's not a place about and so I appreciate that in the LDS tradition, especially, you know, and I talked about this when we when we, when we were um, even talking about our our, our identity, myths or sacred stories that we have told that um, in the LDS tradition, there has been a um, an idea that that pa the past is a place where we are allowed to have beliefs about it. In other words, or rather that that's where we should have, that our faith can be resting on beliefs about the past. Um, and, and, and But that's not um, where I would argue as a pastor in the Latter-day Saint tradition movement that we should ever be. For me, that's... Um, for us, that is like building, um, building our house upon the sand of history, and then when the historians come in and tell you, <laughs> you know, the, the the storm rages and everything like that, our our house of faith is going to collapse, or it has, or it's going to get so, um, or it's going to get so eaten out and worn under that that you end up with this, um, let's say, limited geography Book of Mormon theory where the Nephites are. 12, 20 people living in some cave in Guatemala because you're trying to preserve the, the possibility that it's actually historical. And so you misread the entire text, which is which is a which is a hemispheric um, understanding, you know, of the of the, with the when it was written in order to try to preserve it. That's like saying there was not a universal flood. There was a historical Noah, but he only got on a boat in one little tiny place. And there were maybe only, you know, not, you know, in other words, it wasn't all the animals or whatever you want. You're so desirous of making it historical sure. that you lose the meaning of it. And so that's why I would say okay. instead that, that as a people of faith, we should be building, you know, our testimonies, you know, on the rock. And that is, you know, our relationship to God and to Christ and so forth, and not having, um, not building our faith on history. So that would just be my, my argument. About. Okay. 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 So there's a lot I want to get into that. I, I want to first okay. ask you a question because um, I, think, I think this would be interesting to, to me to hear you answer because as I said, I did just up until recently, even after I had studied polygamy, and I, 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 I mentioned that I believed fervently in polygamy for most of my life. And then- Okay. 
started studying it in the scriptures and the scriptures are what convinced me it was never of God, despite the fact that yes. my grandmother was a polygamist, you know, in the LDS church post. -post yeah, my, my ancestors so. too, by the way, are were polygamists as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, and so, but I still, you know, thought, of course, it was Joseph Smith. I just, he was wrong and that's fine. And my perspective was that was why he was allowed to be killed if, you know, and I, and I was willing to struggle with Joseph Smith and be like, you know, that's fine. I value the Book of Mormon. That doesn't mean I have to think that Joseph Smith is a great guy. It's kind of where I was on based on polygamy right. and some other things. Right. And so it's been my step. So I guess my question is, I sorry, I should get to the question fast. Why do you think that this um, I don't know if I should call it a movement, but this perspective is growing so quickly um, among particularly LDS people? I don't know how I don't know beyond just my community, yeah. but in my community, yeah. in the LDS community, this um, perspective that Joseph was not involved in polygamy, but fought it is growing exponentially. And I'm curious to know why you think that is. Um, so there's a couple of reasons, I think, why, why it's growing so fast. So one is the LDS church, um, when it became an anti-polygamous church, which was not in 1890, in 1890, it became, or whatever, with the manifesto, the official declaration, number one, it became, again, a we are lying about polygamy, uh, you know, right. church, you know, and so it is only with uh, the second manifesto and especially the third and final manifesto in the early 20th century that um, that the LDS church actually became an anti polygamous church. And then when it became an anti polygamous church, the LDS church, you know, went all out in a lot of cases and tried to, you know, um, attack everybody who was continuing to be polygamous and, and trying to get them rounded up and and arrested and and it's and it still continues to be that and it also uh purged its history of all of this stuff so it's this was not in the manuals <laughs> you know it's not in the movies if you if you go and, and you look at the all of the the phony history that the lds church presents of itself all the time like when the, in terms of the statue gardens when you're just trying to you know it's like it's almost like you're trying to make it um you're trying to make history, you know, really be the way it is, and you and you make it make it in bronze, therefore, you know. And so it's just mm -hmm. it's just Joseph and Emma, you know, and and and, that, and that's going to be true for everybody. The, the, it doesn't, you know, the the teachings of the prophet Brigham Young is also not talking about all of all of his wives, you know, and so forth. And so it is yeah. it it got purged all all to all across. So it's not just about Joseph Smith and and. And, jo and Brigham Young and uh, everybody from Brigham Young to Wilford Woodruff, you know, are are in the period of time when the LDS Church was openly pr living polygamy and uh, and was you know publishing it and so forth and and pronouncing it and that it could never stop. So anyway, in other words, it was very open, but it went to hiding it, right? And so I grew up in the LDS Church in the in the 70s. Um, I remember uh, as a first grader, you know, some some kid in New, I lived in New Jersey. Some kid asked me, "Oh, you're a Mormon. How many how many moms do you have?" And I'm like, "What are you talking okay. about, kid? <laughs> what are you talking about?" <laughs> I never, you know. And I like I went I went home and I asked my mom about this. Is it true that uh, that you know Mormons are, you know whatever were polygamists and things like that? And she says, she says yes, uh, it's true. And our, our ancestors were polygamous, but we are always descended from the first wife. And I'm like. This wasn't oh. <laughs> a question that I had, you know what I mean? This was not a concern that I had, you know, are we from the first wife? I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, so, That's not so I, at all. So I, I mean, not only got this confirmation, you know what I mean? Again, cause it's not something, I mean, I was a, a studious kid, you know, uh, ultimately, you know, the, on my way to be the deacon's quorum president, all those kind of things, you know? So I was uh, aware of all this stuff, very active Mormon kid, but I'd never heard of any of this stuff. And so, and so it was, it was only then, like I say, when I confronted my mom that, and then I actually not only had that transmission that we actually are descended, my, my grandparents and great grandparents, not grandparents, but anyway, great, great, great grandparents and so forth were polygamists, but there was even this transmission of what must have been a Utah cultural bias, you know, about which wife are you from and so forth, oh, yeah, because that, funny. that got transmitted down to me as a kid in the seventies even. So, um, so I guess what I would say is that, that why is this taken off now? So because on the one hand, um, there has been a purging of this from the LDS church history in a way that actually people in community of Christ are, are shocked by. They're like, what, how is it that all of these Mormons don't know that, 
you know, that Joseph was a was a polygamist. Don't they always beat that over our heads with that? In other words, so we've never in community of Christ in the RLDS church, we've never had the shift that Mormons have all made where they've purged this out of their collective memory. We never had we never got on that page that we knew that that was happening. And I'll tell you, we, we don't we're not um, up to date on a lot of stuff in, in, in the congregation. So a dear um, lady here who. Uh, we'd had a, an LDS member that she was, uh, who was also a member of our church. He was a dual citizen and every, and he would keep on getting kicked out of his congregate, his Mormon ward when he would, because he wouldn't give up coffee and then he'd come and hang out with us. But then he would get bored of us because he wanted to talk more about the Book of Mormon and stuff like that. Anyway, so then he'd go back and every time he'd go back, um, um, this lady from my congregation, um, wanted to come up with all the old polemics about why Brighamites were wrong. And so she comes at me with, okay, well, tell me all about Adam God, the Adam God theory. And I'm like, no, that won't help. <laughs> you know, that, that yeah. was, we still we still hadn't got the memo that, that, that the LDS church doesn't have Adam God anymore. So, you know, and so anyway, so that, that's kind of where we're at. So what I would say is that's how so, that's how that's happened. And then and then most recently what happened um in the same way that I kind of suggested to you that uh, one person who is very active as a blogger or on the internet in podcasts and things like that can introduce into a people, hey, if this and this happens, uh, I'm leaving the LDS church and moving to Community of Christ. You know, if, uh, in that same way, um, a couple, a handful of people back in the early 2000s, like Rock Waterman and, and Denver Snuffer, um, got a hold of some old RLDS antiquarian stuff, non-historian um, uh, polemics. Well, if you're talking the about RLDS the Prices Church books, the, like the, the Prices, Prices books, books, those were actually, the first volume was published in 2000. So those weren't old. I mean, I can see that you're saying they were antiquarian in their procedure from your perspective, but they're not old. Like, like Okay, so Joseph Smith, my, Joseph my Polygamy is, is published in 2000 then, you're saying? Right. Right. Okay. And that, All right. So then the prices book. So yeah. A little while after that. So the prices. Yeah. So what I would say is it's based. Work. All that is based on the RLDS antiquarian claims. So they 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 publish a oh, new okay. book that that pulls that all together. What the old RLDS antiquarian claims are. So in other words, it's not a historian book. It isn't dealing with the historical evidence at all. It's a um, it's a polemic book that is based on old RLDS polemics that all Community of Christ historians understand are not legitimate. So. Okay, so I have a super a ton of questions there. So, yeah. um, so okay, I do want to respond, but first I have to say, like, like I know in our exchanges and in your presentation, I heard you say um, quite, you know, quite fervently and repeatedly that all historians agree. And yes. what I find interesting there, as I was thinking about it, I so in the LDS tradition, and I think this has been different in the Community of Christ tradition, but we have what I see as an unfortunate idea that you know, that is still somewhat with us that once the prophets have spoken, the thinking has been done. Right. right. And I, and I kind of hear echoes of that in this, once the historians have spoken, the thinking has been done. It's, no. it's a very yeah. similar kind of priestly class because as I look at it, see, I, I very much disagree with why this is growing so fast. Cause I know my experience and I know those who I've been in connection with, and it's, we, all of us, were absolutely knew about polygamy and absolutely knew about Joseph's polygamy. I I never didn't know that Joseph was a, was a polygamist. Yeah. And um and it's actually been things like the Joseph Smith papers, and it's been this evidence pouring out that is available to us now that wasn't before, that has really been impactful. Like when someone um, shares something um, that that's impactful, it's not a claim from from it's not some polemics or as you you know like it's not something the price has said it yeah. might be something that the price has showed but even there we have a lot more now than when the prices started doing their work and in fact um i haven't read fully the prices books but um people have sent me quotes from them or different pages from them or told me things to look up or you know i think the prices have just gathered things that were written earlier i mean in addition to to their own things like by edmund briggs or i mean by jason briggs or um and edmund you know and other writers and right. their claims have actually often been proven out by the joseph smith papers or the complete discourses of brigham young and that's been fascinating to me to see that in many ways those are better um, 
anchored by evidence, by source work, than, um, than the LDS claims that I was raised in. And so that's what's really been the transition for me is I, like, like I, so when, when, now when I'm told historians agree, I'm like, well, let's not just talk about consensus. Let's talk about this source and yeah. let's talk about this source. And that I find to be more valuable. Right. But that's not a academically rigorous approach. So I appreciate that non-specialists, when they um, get a hold of some source or other, want to look at it and say, oh, well, this one, I can make this explanation about why I don't think this is uh, why I don't think that this piece of evidence works, because I think uh, that this guy, I don't believe this particular guy. And then and then you've, re you've dealt with that one in isolation and say, well, I don't listen to anything that William Law says or whatever. And so then now you're going to say, well, um, now I'm looking at this source. Oh, I also don't believe anything that William Clayton is writing and, and so forth. Um, but, I, but that's not um, that's not how uh, you look at evidence as a preponderance of evidence from um, the historical perspective. That is kind of a one on one as you are seeing some particular, uh, I don't know, statement in the Joseph Smith papers or whatever it would be. You're listening to the. Uh, uh, the revelation did, did it, uh, dictated to Newell K. Whitney, and you think that now Newell K. Whitney is a, a liar always, and so he's making this up, you know, later and and to support Brigham Young or something like that. You know, each individual one of those things is a um, this is an apologetic uh, way of dealing with evidence sure. as it comes up one by one by one by one as you're looking at all that kind of thing, and so that's so where I would say it's different. Okay, I hear you. I think I see. I'm glad we're talking because my hope is that maybe it can be ben, ben, beneficial for both of us to kind of understand more about the other side, because I do yeah. want to understand more about this historical perspective and why historians are sort of the the gatekeepers of truth in a way, right? And I think maybe it would be, and maybe I misstated that. I'm sorry if I said not it wrong, all truth, but, just but historical truth. <laughs> historical truth, right? Okay. I and, mean, so for example. Actually, there's a but, there's well, a beautiful well, just, city oh. in oh I'm sorry I, 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 I'm sorry I keep interrupting you so I'm just so <laughs> okay. I, I I love um, I'm just talking about how I love Nauvoo and I love this part of our ancestral heritage of going and trying to build utopia together right and so there's this city in Illinois called Zion Illinois where a group of people got together um, and they built a much more impressive uh, city of Zion with a plot that had a, centered around a temple lot. Uh, and they had built a giant tabernacle there, and uh, it was a church in the late 19th century. And um, and that church, that community became very famous in the 1920s because one of their doctrines was that the world is flat. And so they advertised in, in Popular Mechanics, anybody who could prove that the world's not flat, they'll give them a million dollars or something like that. But I mean, there was no way to prove it because you can't ever prove it to the satisfaction of, of these guys because they've already decided that it is. And so, and so in that case, the keepers of truth in that case would be uh, geologists, <laughs> geographers, you know, physicists and so forth. It's so, and because that would be a belief that is a religiously based belief um, that that particular church group had. They've since given up that belief, but, um, but in any event, that was, uh, it's an, it's, yeah. So that's what I would say. Historians, unfortunately, are in a position of sometimes, and sometimes they're doing it gleefully. I, I, I disapprove of historians who are just going around and debunking things and who are trying to tell people, no, this can't, you know, this didn't happen in order to like debunk the, I don't, never told that story about Kirtland Temple to debunk it. I, what I always am trying to do with everybody um, is is share additional insights so that we can understand our faith in a richer way, you know, so okay. that we can. So, so sure. I've come back to this, knowing all of these things about the historical problems. And yet that has caused me to be, want to be part of, uh, of a church that is approaching its history with integrity and isn't just saying, um, man, I'm never putting that. I love the David and Goliath story, you know, where this young stripling, you know, shepherd boy with so much faith is able to fight the giant off with, uh, and I'm never putting in the story where he then uh, just kills his servant Uriah the Hittite in order to, because he's already had an adulterous affair with the guy's wife, you know, so in other words, there, we, that's in the Bible, <laughs> you know what I mean? Even it's yeah. not, it's not historical. So anyway, go, go ahead. <laughs> so. So, so just like, like I very much value truth. I think that the truth is always the best thing, no matter what. So I'm just about wanting to find the truth. Like I said, I was 
deeply committed to polygamy. I'm on record teaching that polygamy was a beautiful thing. And that cost me a lot to change and come out publicly and say, no, polygamy was never of God. And, and a similar process happened when I came out and said, okay, well, Joseph was not a polygamist. And so I'm just caring about truth. And the thing that I think is um, good to like, like, I think if you're not able to understand us, you're not able to speak to us. And and so mm -hmm. when I hear you kind of represent what you think we're doing, it feels very much like straw men to me because that is not at all representative of what I do, what I've been doing or what other people that I know. You know, we're definitely not taking one point in isolation trying to debunk. We're trying to look at the totality and find the various sources that this um that this perspective, this narrative is built on and see if they stand up to scrutiny and see what sources have been neglected. Because that's what seems to me has been happening very much. Like I have so many examples I could go to, but um, let me let me ask you this one just quickly. Have you seen the, and I, and I should have it to show you, I can look it up if you need me to, but the um, October 5th entry in, in Joseph Smith's journal and um, have you have you seen the edits in that through? Do you know which one I'm talking about? I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure where precisely. You know, so you're saying William Clayton is like taking a journal. Is that what October it is? October and... October fifth. Oh my gosh, is 1843? I believe the entry in Joseph Smith's journal done by I believe Willard Richards. Yeah. And so. Um, okay. So, are are you familiar with that? Have you seen? Probably, but I mean, you have to point out, oh, okay, but I don't sorry. know, I'm not, I'm not well, necessarily so familiar, familiar with, I know that some of the entries in the journal um, have indications that are, that, that something's going on, you know, they're, they're obfuscating a little bit about, um, you know, what some of Joseph's calendars, because they're, they don't want, you know, they're, they're keeping an official record here, but in some cases, yeah. uh, people have pointed to journal entries and said, that this is hiding uh, a liaison or something like that. And so, and so that so, may so well let be, me, yeah. Let me tell you this one. And I'm a little bit hesitant to share it because I don't want it to, um, I don't want you to think this is the one piece of evidence that I'm glomming on. No, no, that's you fine. know, this is that, one. I, I don't, it's not, in, in not a, in, no one piece of evidence is the, that's not how it works, you know? So it doesn't, right. nothing is hanging on one piece of evidence one way or the other. So what's interesting, so yes, October 5th, 1843, the, we can see this now that we have access to the Joseph Smith papers. Yeah. We were all raised with Joseph Smith saying, I have always said no man shall have but one wife unless I say so, for there is only one man in authority. That was in our manuals. We always read that. That's what Joseph Smith quoted to say that he had evidence that Joseph taught polygamy in the RLDS, LDS um, discussions and debates right. in, the, in those letters. And so, but if you look at the original journal entry, and, and I'm not claiming that Joseph Smith's journals are perfect or anything, but this is yeah. a very interesting little tidbit the original entry says evening at home walked up and down with scribe and gave instructions to try those who were preaching teaching the doctrine of plurality of wives on this law joseph forbids it and the practice thereof no man shall have but one wife yes that's the original entry and then you can see the the um the edits over time as oh, it was yeah. changed and then what it became, and you can see the different handwriting, you can see the crossed out, you can see things left in. And we have on record many, many um, accounts of Brigham Young sitting with the historians that he appointed saying that yeah. they were editing the history, right? Creating yes. the history, like the things they cut out and the things that they added. So that entry became evening at home and walked up and down the street with my scribe, gave instructions to try those persons who were preaching, teaching, or practicing the doctrine of plurality of, of wives. This is the part that we always read. For according to the law, I hold the keys of this power in the in the last days, for there is never but one on earth at a time on whom the power and its keys are conferred. And I have constantly said, no man shall have but one wife at a time unless the Lord directs otherwise. Okay. And so that's so you're saying that, that was added in. became yep. that. That yep. was added in by Brigham Young. Yes. And yep. that's one piece, but the, but that pattern continually emerges. I have myself looked at four at least different documents, and there are so many more that do this exact same thing, that add these subtle little changes or alterations that are highly concerning, right? Yeah, yeah. And I and I don't think... 
I, I yeah. don't think that, I mean, that's just, as I said, one, one of many examples that isn't adequately dealt with or even acknowledged by the, like, so for me, when I hear this historical consensus, I think the historical cons consensus is outdated because as you said, it started kind of with Von Brody and grew from there, right? But Von Brody knew that children were an essential part of this argument. And she named many, many children of Joseph Smith in her book that sure. we now know she, she was wrong on all of those. What? Yeah, but okay. But no, it, it's not, not an essential that, thing. Again, but she was using that right? as a as what she thought was additional proof based on right. based on several of the women, you know, there were some indications that they thought that that kid was Joseph Smith's kid. And so right. and in some cases, but in other cases, they were just some surmises. But in any event, I appreciate that. Yes, there is a uh, there. This this story is par is partially muddled because of competing RLDS and LDS apologetics. So so because Joseph Smith the third promoted his particular um, view about uh, Brigham Young being the originator of polygamy, um, that caused the Brighamite Church and Brigham Young specifically to want to have lots of counter and competing evidence. And my view of Brigham Young is that he is a, a scoundrel, a liar, a, a bigot, a, um, a murderous person. He was a, a unindicted felon co-conspirator and after the fact at the minimum with the Mountain Meadows Massacre, but is actually, I think the blood is sort of on his hands, even though he didn't personally necessarily order it to happen the way it actually happened but he set the events in motion i would say and so could he have, would he have told his you know his historians or would people who are in his um his orbit have uh doctored stuff to make it even better and so forth and also to um to bolster his claims of course so that so so yes individual me... individual uh evidence has to be read in light of the biases for those sources so that's how when i'm reading um brigham young because of, i have i have very negative feelings about brigham young and i don't think that he was a good leader and all these kind of things and so and so i i i tend to be skeptical of things that he is saying because you have to read into it his own um his own claims and his own agenda in the same way that um i i I would wait the same way John C. Bennett's stuff as I okay. write Brigham Young's stuff, you know? Sure. Okay. So one thing I want to point out, this journal entry was changed long before the RLDS claims. It was changed early on. I I, I want to say before the 1852, before 132 was presented. I can't, I can't say that okay. for sure. I'll so maybe, yeah. So I didn't the know the details of this edition, particular piece of evidence like you're talking The about. very first edition of the church yeah. history included that. Like what, it, what I have seen is that from the very beginning, Brigham Young set on a course to alter the history to make it appear that Joseph was a polygamist. Like, and, and what's interesting is when I hear you say um, your negative feelings about Brigham Young and, and how untrustworthy he is, and yet you completely agree with his narrative. So that's interesting to me because like William Clayton, the more I read of him, the more problems, tremendous problems I see with his account. I, I just did an episode, um, two times ago on the, the second part of the expositor. So it's not that I'm just trying to throw out William Law, for example, I'm trying to get in and see what can we verify these claims on either side. And then I just did an episode last week where um, a guy named Jeremy Hoop, who's done a lot of work in this area, showed the William Law diaries. And I think really came as close as you can come to proving that they were not contemporaneous, but that they were later productions just like I believe that section 132 is. And so, um, well, so, so here, for William here just, Law, oh, go ahead. For William Law though, I mean, he- For William he, Clayton, no, William oh, Clayton. Oh, William Clayton, I'm sorry. I oh. thought you were saying William Law. William okay. Clayton's journals. Okay. Because, because William saying. Clayton yeah. desperately wanted to be in with Brigham Young. You know, he was sure, a sure. Brighamite, absolutely. And so it's fascinating to me that while you have all these problems with Brigham Young, you completely agree with his narrative. No, and the narrative so it's not, I don't completely agree with his narrative. So, oh, for okay. example, um, he says that he had, you know, he said, for example, says that he has keys. Uh, I mean, you know, and so like they're putting that keys. I'm talking about his narrative it. on polygamy. 
Okay. But his narrative on polygamy is not merely his narrative. So we're talking about you know, all of these other, other factions that are also consonant and agree with this. So again, people who went off to become Strangites who are absolutely opposed to Brigham Young, they also testified in the same way. The people who became Whiteites, people who, again, they're not in favor of Brigham Young, people who uh, left the movement altogether, uh, or people who became Rigdonites, uh, people who were all opposed to Brigham Young, their uh, stories are also, you know, you know, bringing back to the same thing that polygamy is being practiced in Nauvoo. It's authorized by Joseph Smith, whoever the originator of it is. It is not as something that makes any sense for all of these enemies of Brigham Young if he somehow is the originator of it, and this is a secret cabal that he is running that um, that Joseph is somehow fighting, uh, it, it it's it it's not all his faction that have done it. It's all the factions who who go back, look back to this. Everybody, uh, McClellan, well, uh, who is already left, you know, he comes and uh, and talks to Emma, and Emma, you know, confirms all of this oh, that has oh, happened. So that's one thing I wanted to get into because I I would somewhat disagree with your framing of that. I would say that um, the the categories it looks like to me, and I haven't studied this universally, but it's sort of enemies of Joseph from all different camps, from various ways, or Brighamites, and and I know that there were several sects that um, pursued polygamy, like for example James Strang, and um, anyways the someone else I was going to mention, but I, I don't think that's mysterious. I don't think it's hard to understand why, um, well, that's something we can get into later, but why religious leaders tend to pursue polygamy is very, it doesn't have to have been taught them by Joseph Smith. It's a very natural thing for religious leaders to do, as we can see from history, which in a way makes me that much more, I guess, surprised and impressed that Joseph Smith didn't do that. And I know that we disagree on that. But as I look at it, I'm like, wow, he was a better guy than I thought. That's been my take on it. I, this is my this is my belief on polygamy and also blood atonement. Like men in power don't like restraints, right? If, if you have unrestrained power, unrestrained money, you shouldn't be restrained to one woman. Your wife's eight. Like that's a restraint you can't have. Men in the world, like athletes, politicians, business owners, movie stars, don't have to worry about that in general. They can have all the partners that they want. Religious men have a restraint that they need to find a way to get around, right? So I think polygamy happens very naturally as God approved lack of restraint in this one <laughs> important area. Just like I think blood atonement well, again, is like, similar. Like we agree, of... claimed God approved, not really God approved. <laughs> claim, oh, claim. Right, so. exactly. Yes. It's like if, if you're going to be a religious leader and not have that restraint, God has to approve it somehow. And polygamy is the way that that happens. Just like I think if you are Brigham Young and there's someone who's very annoying to you and you need to get rid of them, you need blood atonement. So it can be God approved. Um, shedding people's blood, right? I, I haven't done my episodes on blood atonement yet, but I, I have researched it extensively. So anyway, so I don't think it's that surprising that, that other religious leaders pursued polygamy. And I haven't seen where Jacob Strang said that Joseph taught it to him. Maybe I haven't, maybe I've missed Well, James that. Strang didn't, was and an outsider. Seen... And so he wasn't, he didn't. Tell, James he Strang. Didn't. James Strang was an outsider. And so he wasn't told. What I'm saying is people who became Strangites who were insiders um, still, still continue to testify that it was Joseph who who had had taught it, and that's what eventually convinced Strang, who was initially an opponent of polygamy, when he gathered enough insiders around him, then he um, was persuaded to it. But he originally was he originally actually had been a major opponent of polygamy because he was an outsider, you know. So unlike even though he had a very successful uh, counterclaim to Brigham Young, it wasn't from being an insider. It was because um, Brigham Young wasn't claiming to be that's a prophet. Matter. And so here, here was a guy who's saying, okay. I'm the prophet, I've been appointed by an angel and so forth. I've, I've got plates and things. And so that became sure. uh, something that gathered people to him. Um, and so, for example, so, William Smith, who um, uh, had been taught polygamy from his brother, who was continuing to act as a he polygamist. Claim that? I, haven't seen where he, I haven't seen where William says that he was taught it by Joseph. So we don't have... We okay. don't have him claiming it, <laughs> that he does, because actually okay. when he writes stuff, he... Um, perjures himself. He says that not, that was nothing that like that was ever involved. But we know that he was involved with polygamy himself because he was caught at it 
um, uh, under with the Strangites. So the Strangites kicked him out for being a polygamist. And same thing, mm -hmm. the early reorganized church, the precursor to the reorganized church, twice caught him. With um, Shane and, yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, and so therefore, yeah. when he later says that nobody was a polygamist, this is all made up or something like that, he's, he's not telling the truth. So he's not, a, he's not a, okay. um, he's not a, a, a truthful witness as a result of that, but he's definitely a wild card yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. But, but I also want to, can I mention, let's... okay. When we've been talking about polygamy being bad and not of God, I do think that case for that in modern times kind of has to also be made. Because a lot of people say, well, what does it matter if consenting adults all decide they want to do whatever they want to do? Um, why are you arguing against um, polygamy now? And so the case, the reason why um, specifically uh, religious polygyny is uh, against, for example, the Canadian Charter of Human Freedoms, it's understood to be not sure. um, something that it, it's because polygyny specifically, in other words, where it is one patriarch with multiple women creates a system that demeans women and is inherently sexist. So, for example, the way it works, people always ask, well, how would the Mormons ha do this, you know, throughout the 19th century where where you have polygamy and so forth? How is it that they don't have all these extra women for, you know, compared to how many men they have? And the way it works is that the marrying age for women goes way down. <laughs> The, uh, right. the marrying age for high status men, you know, is still low. For low status men, it goes way high. Low status men only have they get kicked out a couple wives, and, and they can also get kicked out too in modern in in the modern times in the smaller churches now that are still polygamists and so forth. And so that's what I'm just I just want to make the case why, um, like I say, I left the Mormon Church over sexism. I'm still opposed to sexism. That's why I'm also you know opposed to religious polygyny. Um, you know, which is right. Say, I think the difference is. It's not really consenting adults when you are That's told, right. I speak for God and God says you need to do this, right? Exactly. That's a very different. Exactly. It's an abusive authority when somebody is saying that. Yeah. And so whether or not whether or not you think Joseph Smith abused that authority, we don't, definitely can say, for example, that Brigham Young and all of his successors all the way down, you know, until um, Heber J. Grant were all polygamists and Brigham Young and many of them, most of them also, you know, conducted underage marriages. Uh, and mm -hmm. and that, that's all in the historic record that is also not uh, disputed, I think. <laughs> so, right. A very, so, a very a good friend of mine who's been a very faithful member of the church for all of her 70 plus years just said to me and still is just said to me the other day, Brigham Young was a child trafficker. And so, you know, so we are able to grapple with this history because he, he really like he was a very troubling Figure. He's a very troubling figure in our past that we have to grapple with, which also should give some credibility to the fact that we're not just wishful thinking, because for those like me staying in the church, I'm willing to grapple with difficult history from our leaders. Right. Okay. I just yeah. don't see the evidence. So so it's not a it's not a um, motivated or, you gotcha. know, it's not because I can't handle the truth or I need to somehow save Joseph. I, I've said this. My, my listeners know this because I have said it so many times. It was actually studying Emma's life that convinced me of this perspective. And I do feel, I feel a real closeness to Emma and a real desire to defend her. Cause I do not like what this narrative says about Emma. Like that, that to me feels more pers personal, like that I'll fight about, you know? Yeah. Cause I have a, a tremendous amount of respect and love for Emma from what I understand of her. And so, so can I, there were three main points that I wanted to talk about from your presentation, sure, but I don't yeah. want to like if, the, if there's anything you want to present, you know, well, like, I want to I want to actually react to what you were just saying, because actually, I really appreciate what you said in terms of grappling with the other leaders. And you're very aware of, you know, what they did and the, and the problems. And you again, I think we are like we said, we agreed that that's not of God. And, and yet these guys are the prophets of the church who were doing that all the way all the way through up until. Uh, and so I, I appreciate that. And so I actually want to just as a um, uh, for your historical method, you know, okay. as you as you're working on this, the the direction now that you need to do in order to create um, uh, in order to create a different historical um, narrative in order to actually have something that you know, we're not saying the historians are guardians of this and nobody's allowed into the club or something like that. But what you need is a counter 
thesis. And so if it's going to be something like Brigham Young created it, now, the goal now is going to be to start um, making all kinds of evidence that is showing that. And like, um, and, and so, for example, the evidence that you're giving about Brigham Young uh, forging the documents and things like that, or it, like in his control, that that's going to be helpful for that. And so and so that's mm -hmm. the, the, the the direction as opposed to um, working on explaining away all of the other Joseph Smith evidence, the this the, you need the positive evidence of of implicating Brigham Young is what I would just okay. uh, suggest so just you so as an academic focus. <laughs> yeah. Just so you know, that's exactly what I and many others are doing. Okay, like, good. We've gone extensively through um, um, Brigham, Young, Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball's and William Clayton's um, diaries and letters in England in 1841 and showed that it pre-existed. And, and we have so many quotes of Brigham Young acknowledging and admitting that he came up, that this was his doctrine. Right. Okay. And we also have a lot of things to show that William Clayton's accounts are just impossible. Um, like, like this is a little thing, but I think it's an interesting one. For example, William Clayton, you know, it's William Clayton. This all rests on William Clayton, really. We have his journals and then his affidavits. And that's where we get the story of how 132 came about. That mm -hmm. really, the only other thing we really have is the expositor with Austin Cowell saying it was read in the High Council. Everything else is kind of built on those earlier well, claims. Oh, go ahead. In terms of in terms of contemporary evidence, what you're saying. That's what so I'm saying. Words, I'm saying everything so later. So we have all had kinds of. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. we have the, we have the same, you know, we have the same uh, in terms of uh, uh, William Marks, you know, has testimony of that. It's simply, but it's not. We don't have his contemporary testimony of it. In other words, so we, well, but we have. But, but we have a very consistent testimony from him that I think is worth understanding. But I like including. His, his later statements clarifying his earlier statements as well. I think that we need to look at that as a totality as a whole, because he gave that account maybe four to six times. And, and in some of the later ones, he was like, hey, this is, you know, he clarifies what he was saying that, that rings very true to me. And so I really like William Marks. I think he's a man of integrity. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's very trustworthy. But um, what I was saying is that, yeah, go ahead. oh, so William Clayton, claims in his affidavit, which we really base this all on, in, in, in how 132 came about in the upper room of the brick store with just Brigham and Hiram and Clayton and, you know, that whole story. And then he says that a day or two, that two or three days after he wrote it, Joseph told him that he had let Emma destroy it because she was so whiny and pouty and wouldn't leave him alone. And so just to get rid of her annoyance, he allowed her to burn it. And the only other copy was the one made by Kingsbury, kept by Bishop Whitney, who nobody else knew about. Right. It was a secret copy. So that just this is, like I said, a little thing. But it leaves me to wonder what exactly did Hiram Smith go across the street to get in August of that year to read to the high council? Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting question that I haven't seen addressed adequately. And also that same day in the high council, July, um, August 12th, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, when he supposedly read that. The only notes we have, the only minutes we have are that William Marks was teaching with him. And so the fact that William Marks wouldn't have known about 132, would have even had the question of whether Joseph was involved if Hiram read it that day in the high council, makes no sense at all. And these are just really basic parts of this narrative that fall apart with the slightest amount of investigation that I haven't seen people, like people just instead call, it, call me a polygamy denier and tell me I'm a flat earther and a Holocaust denier. And I'm like, I, that okay, that's fine. But can we just talk about the evidence? You, you know, because I think so, the evidence so again, is worth So again, even, about. The, even though if you're what going to, so I think that you could make a bunch of different questions about the origin of 132 and whether or not we have the exact, um, there is a revelation that Joseph Smith gives, whether or not 132 is, is that is a, more detailed and nuanced component of the question, which is Joseph Smith, yes, is a polygamist. How much of 132 is, in fact, the actual revelation that he dictated, and how much of it is uh, uh, maybe the totally a different? Or was it entirely a forgery and things like that? So that is not um, right. that may be what that testimony that you're talking about may be core to the the provenance for 132, but that's not. Mm -hmm. um, that's not what Joseph Smith as a polygamist is hanging on. 
Okay. Okay. That's fair. So, so I just, I, like, I, I really appreciate us having this discussion because it lets us round out the, the conversation. So there were, I, as I listened to your, um, to your presentation, I did feel, my feeling was if I had listened to this, you know, even five years ago, I would have found it very compelling. But now that I've studied so much, I found it from my perspective, like, like I just, all the way through, it was like, no, no, no. You know, I found, I, I really objected to a lot of it because sure. of the study I've done. So, so it was hard to kind of narrow down, but there were two and maybe three main points that I kind of wanted to talk about. Not, they're not the only things, but there are things I haven't yet covered on my podcast. And so I think they'll be interesting to the audience and then, yeah. and things I was excited to explore. So the, the three things that I wanted to talk about are first kind of the, um, the claim that we don't have Emma's account. And, and, you know, you mentioned that we don't have, that we would love to, I think the quote was, if I can find it, we would love to have Emma's own words, but we don't, we only have the accounts of what she said to others. Right. So I wanted to talk about that. And then another one I really wanted to talk about, and, and we can start with whichever one you want, but is Sarah and Whitney. I think yes. that's a great discussion to have because that is the one piece of supposed contemporary evidence that we have is the letter from Joseph to the Whitney's. Yes. And so, and then the other one I wanted to talk about was just briefly about um, Fanny Alger and the sources that you use to talk about Fanny Alger. So, is that okay so, if we talk about those things? Sure, but I want to also um, I want to also state though for all of these cases, um, this is also a issue. So with the Fanny Alger especially, or Fanny Alger, whichever you would prefer <laughs> to say. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Um, I grew uh, up. I always grew up with Fanny Alger. I didn't hear anyone say Alger. Okay. Until Lindsay Fanny Alger. Then so I'll I say. say um, but um, yeah, what I'll say is that uh, there's there's a, two different issues, um, and I, this is also true when I'm talking about the historical Jesus, right? And so when I'm doing um, battle with, you know, <laughs> calling it battle because it's a podcast and so forth, whatever, whatever, with with these mythicist guys, you know, on on a on a, on a YouTube podcast or something like that. Um, there is a big difference between what you're talking about to, that shows that there was a historical Jesus. And then once we've established that, then going through and trying to, under, trying to understand, well, what can we say about the historical Jesus? And um, how can we, in the case of people for whom um, they are, are members of Christian community, people of faith, um, when we're, how can we be pastoral in talking about things that may not be historical, like we were talking about at the beginning of this Christmas stories, which are not, not, which are the fiction, which are made up by the evangelists, right? So the Christian stories are not uh, part of the historical Jesus, right? And so, um, and so, and so how do we do that pastorally? And so what I'll just say is the reason um, for my focus, especially on, on Emma is because I'm talking to a community of Christ audience. And so for um, community of Christ people, they're, uh, they the where they get to at the end of all this they don't care if Joseph Smith abused his power I mean they do care but in other words they can get over it but but they get sad about it because Emma is so central to um, the reorganization Community of Christ is Emma's church um, after uh, after the church was reorganized she helped us create the next two hymnals you know again so so four there are four hymnals in our tradition that were from Emma and and so on and so and so it's trying to be pastoral to sure. try to understand for our members why why would Emma have why is this published as Emma's last testimony in the Herald <laughs> you know in other words because they okay. don't want to disbelieve Emma and so that's one of the so that's that's one of the reasons why I brought that up and talked about that and then for the um for the I Fanny Alger yeah for Fanny Alger uh, this is not um this isn't proof at all of anything. <laughs> and so, so what? So if if was if Joseph Smith's polygamy was limited to the kind of thing that he was doing with Fanny Alger, then um, then I would just conclude it was an affair myself. But you could conclude whether he did it or not, depending on whether you tend to believe Oliver Cowdery more than Joseph Smith in terms of your and that kind of almost is coming down to your beliefs about the kind of thing that either one of them would do in different circumstances, right? Uh, but so so that's not a proof of anything. Why why I would talk about that is once we already understand that Joseph is a polygamist, then what I want to do is to explain to people for whom Joseph Smith is important, how did he get to this place? And so then and so we hopefully are trying to and sometimes we more so than others, I'm trying to be more pastoral or not on that too, even though I ultimately 
then we'll conclude that this is an abuse of authority and we unfortunately have to um, have as much or little pity for him as we want to, depending on where we are and how we are feeling about what happened. So some people are very angry and that's an appropriate response. Some people are saddened for him or whatever, but in other words, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be bringing that I, I, when I'm doing that, that one presentation and I'm talking about like him talking about it in the book of Mormon, the Lamanite prophecy and all those kind of things. That's not proof because the, if it was only those things, we wouldn't, we would be able to dismiss it ultimately. What happens is, is it becomes so widespread in Nauvoo that the evidence uh, is, is overwhelming. So that's, that's all I'm going to okay. say. So, okay. Yeah. So, so it'd be good to talk about each of these because I very much yeah. um, disagree. I, I, so, so, I mean, I, I disagree with the perspective that it was so wide, widespread in Nauvoo that it's overwhelming. I think it's so widespread in Utah and the Utah testimonies are what this is all based in. And, 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 and we can talk about believing women if we want to. I don't find that to be a compelling argument because you don't believe women in a totalitarian system whose only way no. is to, you don't believe Elizabeth Smart when sure. she says, no, I'm not Elizabeth. You don't believe the FLDS women when they are saying, no, this is my child and I was not underage. And I don't, you know, when when women's only way sure. of existing is, is in the system, then you don't call them liars. You look at them in the system that they're in and take that into great consideration with the claims they make, particularly when you take the claims they make and try to investigate them and they fall apart terribly. They can't be verified by history. That's, that's, that would be, is what my argument would be. Okay. You know? Yeah. So, so, but, um, and I did, I, I did appreciate your pastoral approach with Emma. You know, I didn't really get what you were saying with Fanny. Like I didn't get that you were trying to be pastoral with Joseph. That's not how it came across to me, but I, but I did with Emma. Yeah. And, and I, um, but isn't Joseph Smith the third also very central to like, it's even Joseph Smith, the third's church more than Emma's because he was the one that had to make the decision to come and be the president. Right. And Emma Absolutely. said that she would not advise him either way. So he seems very central. A, let me too. just show you here. I'm going to turn this. We have on, okay. on the wall here in the heritage in our library, there's a, we have portraits of Emma and Joseph Smith, the third. Okay. <laughs> Mother anyway. and son. <laughs> So yeah, oh, they're that's definitely. So interesting. That's kind of so, the pieta of the of the community of Christ, the RLDS. Right. So tradition. we don't have any pictures of Joseph on the walls here. I've <laughs> developed of, of, okay. of his son, yes. Okay. Um, Joseph the third. All right. So yeah. So yeah. No, of course he and 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 so and so he has a very nuanced way that he approaches it. Um, and, and his his primary and overriding point is that. Uh, whatever was done, it's not of God, right? And so, we, if it had been done, right, it, it's not of God. And so, and so, and so, definitely, he led the anti-polygamy faction of the church. So, lots of right. people and had been I, opposed to this in Nauvoo. Okay, I personally believe he was a hundred percent sincere, and actually that he was a hundred percent right. I don't think that he was. I, I don't see him the same way as trying to twist something. I think if you understand very much at all about um, religious leaders, as, like if you look at how well polygamous leaders, they are raising up their sons. Joseph had planned for Joseph the third to be his successor, from everything I understand. That's right. And it's impossible for me to believe that he wouldn't be teaching Joseph the third, the gospel as he understood it. I, I, 11 is pretty old. Like in our tradition, he's about to get the priesthood. He's, you know, he would have been taught. And also like the little house they were living in on um, July 12th, 1843, when Hiram supposedly brought the revelation to Emma, Emma would have been so shaken up and upset. Like, Joseph, um, Joseph Smith III always testified about how well his parents got along, how loving and kind their household was. And, and mm -hmm. there aren't these stories. We only get that from William Clayton. So, so, so for me, I tend to think, oh, wow, we should take Joseph III's testimony seriously. And then, so I guess the question I had was when you talked about Joseph III and um, Emma's final testimony, I got the sense that you were implying that Joseph lied about what his mother had said, because you said we don't have Emma's actual words, and she may have been misrepresented. So we don't, we don't know where, what's happening there. So we know that the testimony is false. But How we do we know the know. testimony's false? See, there because again. Because Joseph Smith again. was a polygamist. <laughs> so, and, and Emma, and we are aware that Emma was aware of it. And so, in other words, we have plenty, of, all, we have uh, as much testimony that we know what was going on, and we know that she... Was had been lied to by Joseph Smith about it that she had a limited participation 
around the time that the uh, the revelation was dictated. The revelation seems to be geared towards her. And so whether or not you believe that that is the actual document, it does seem to be addressing the time uh, and what we know about the time. And so then, so then she, in the end, is aware of her son's crusade that he has been on, where he has um, outlived most of the old members, uh, the RLDS members who were in the know and who were opposed to his narrative. And, uh, and so at the very end of her life, um, either she, uh, she lies for him uh, because she knows that's what he wants to hear, or she tries to give it a little bit of a nuance. And so some of it is, uh, is the kind of lie that her husband had been making. So Brigham Young changes the policy of, that Joseph Smith Jr. had about lying about polygamy to being open about it. And he changes it on the fly. So, um, you know, L LDS members are off in Europe disclaiming polygamy and then the, and then it and then it, oh sorry about that we, we now we're now we're coming clean so so there's no reason for Emma to follow Brigham Young's policy of not lying about polygamy she could continue to follow her husband's policy of lying about it and so whether or not she was doing that or whether or not she was doing it to help her son or whether or not we don't know Joseph the third wrote it himself. I don't, I'm not saying that he would do that, but anyway, we don't know what happened. I would think probably so, what's happening is she's following her husband's policy and, or, and, or saying what she want her son wants her to say. So my perspective is, is that the lying for the Lord is a Brighamite policy and everyone we have on record doing that is in the Utah tradition in the Brigham Young tradition. I don't think that that came from Joseph Smith. And I think, so that's why I want to investigate this is because we start with the assumption, like like I, that quote I read of yours earlier, that we don't start with the end in mind and then cherry pick sources. No, we're not it looks to me that. like that's what's happening here because it's like no. we're starting with the end in mind and the site, we, we know Joseph No, we was already have concluded though. We have concluded it from the evidence that Joseph is a polygamist. Now we have to explain the tiny bits of counter- Beaning evidence. And so this is um, a, a late statement okay. reminiscence or whatever of Emma, which is making a counter claim that is motivated by her church's position, public position. Okay, and, so, so and so we can read the bias into this source as a late reminiscence and say, this is a, a, a biased re reminiscence and we can see why it is, uh, it is contaminated in this way, therefore. Okay, so so if, if it's okay, I looked up several statements we do have of Emma's, either firsthand. I only have two that are firsthand, and then we have several that were reported in interviews. And I just wanted to share those because um, I think it's important to get the whole totality. It's not just her final testimony. And okay. so I'm trying to decide which way. So, so um, I guess, should I start with that or start with William McClellan? Because you kind of held up Joseph Smith III versus William McClellan. Like you kind of said, we don't have Emma's own testimony, but we have what jo her son said about if her. You, if have you have William other McClellan statements said. of Emma, that would be more details okay. than I maybe was aware of. But in any event, what, the, what I will tell you before I hear them <laughs> is the policy that she inherited from her husband was lying for the Lord. And that's what they were doing in Nauvoo. And so if she is at any time doing that, uh, you know, then that's what she's doing. So. Okay, and to me, that's a huge assumption because I've never seen any evidence of Joseph teaching that, saying that. The only reason we say that is because the later Utahns testify of that and William Clayton testifies of it. I have never seen anything from Emma, from Joseph, or from anybody else that says, and, and another thing that we always claim is that Joseph was using, Brian Hills calls them carefully worded denials, saying it's not polygamy, it's celestial plural marriage. And I, right. I've i never seen Joseph differentiate. He does everything he can from my perspective, along with Hiram and Emma, to lump them all in together and say, nope, this is all bad. So um, so really quickly with William McClellan, I was, I was, actually astonished that um, people take his testimony seriously at all, even plausible, because, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that William McClellan not only left the church, but became very actively opposed to the church, was part of the M Missouri mobs. And in mm -hmm. fact, um, we have accounts that he um, ransacked and robbed Emma's and Joseph's home and barn when, when Joseph was in prison. And then we have accounts that he... Um, this is a later Utah reminiscence, so I don't, I can't say for sure, but it's in it's in the hi history that he asked the sheriff permission to flog Joseph while he was in custody, 
And so, um, so he was very much an enemy and yet he writes. So, so just for my audience, who's not aware with this, I'll fill the, fill, fill them in really quickly that, um, William McClellan wrote two letters to Joseph Smith, the third one in 1860 and one in 1872. And he said that his, that, that all you need to do is go ask your mother. And he said that he visited Emma in 1847 and that she acknowledged to him or affirmed to him several things that the revelation came from Joseph. She says that he says that Emma acknowledged to him that when Joseph the third was born, um, Joseph, his father was having an affair with a Miss Hill and that she forgave him. She said, he said that, you know, it goes on and on and on. And I find it astonishing to think that Emma would sit and tell these things to William McClellan, who had literally robbed and ransacked her home and barn while her husband was in prison. That is, I, I like, I cannot believe we even give that the slightest amount of well, credibility. Well, she recommends him to her son in terms of when the reorganization happens. And she thinks that he, uh, you know, so there's a, there's a letter where she is recommending him to be part of the reorganization. And so the implication, the reason why I mentioned it was because of that, because the implication then was that they had, to me, was that they had, uh, uh, whatever the, the kind of polemics and things that were happening in terms of the Mormon Missouri war period that in the aftermath of the Nauvoo war, that the implication to me was that maybe they have had a, you know, they've come back together and, and, a reconciliation. and settled things and reconciled in some way. And that he is, and that's why he was able to stay with them and visit with them uh, in terms of this recollection that he has for Joseph the third. And so the only reason I brought that, that up then is because, um, Emma seems to have been fondly, you know, positively disposed towards him. And he is repeating Emma hearsay the same way that Joseph III um, does in terms of the final testimony. We, we don't, and, and as opposed to something that she's written in her own hand, that we have her letter and her saying this or that. And that, that was why I, I brought that as a try to, trying to, um, for our LDS members who are especially, um, aware the only, probably the only piece of evidence at all that they're aware of they don't know any about William Clayton's journals or anything like that um, that's not part of our narrative what they're part what they know is what Emma said and so what we're just trying to understand for uh, for them you know explain this final testimony at so-called of okay. Emma's and so, okay, and so but you are aware you are aware that your narrative comes from William Clayton right so no, the evidence of Joseph's polygamy is, is not only from William Clayton. You are, I, I appreciate what you're saying, that maybe that is the, um, the major source for us understanding that DNC 132 is the revelation. But we have, we have amazing amounts of evidence, contemporary and otherwise, of Joseph Smith practicing polygamy in Nauvoo. It is not based okay, only so on William Clayton's, Clayton's journal. Okay, so the only source I have seen, other than the later Utah claims, which are built on William Clayton, the only sources I have seen for the emergence of 132 or for the um, troubles uh, in Joseph's and Emma's marriage. It doesn't matter about 132. Matter about 130, 132 is oh, not or, relevant. Well, I was going to say also for She's the having all the these troubles wives in, before 132. But the troubles in Joseph's and Emma's marriage, William Clayton is also the only source I'm aware of for that that's considered to be contemporaneous. So, but we can get into it. So, so let me, let me read some of these other quotes from Emma, and then maybe it will help us to go on and talk about Sarah um, and Whitney, because that's, that okay. is contemporaneous. So I'm assuming that's when, so um, anyway, and I can, I can just attach them below if you're not interested in, you, you know, I don't have to read them right now. No, go ahead and read. No, do, please. So, um, so let's see. Oh, okay. Let me, sorry, I'm finding my place. Um, so oh, Emma had this printed in the newspaper and I know that it's easy to come to it with the bias that she was always lying for the Lord. But I think that that again is a confirmation, is a assumption that's put onto evidence that we should at least consider what she is saying. So she had printed in the newspaper, we, the undersigned members of the Ladies Relief Society and married females do certify and declare that we know of no system of marriage being practiced in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, save the one contained in the Doctrine and Covenants. And that was published published in the yeah, October yeah. Our 42 yeah. times and seasons. And then also from the Voice of Innocence, that extensive 
article and that she had written in February and presented in February, March of 44. So just a couple of parts from it. She says, curse the man that preys upon female virtue. So I, I'm, I'm taking some pieces and putting them together because it's so wordy. Spurn him from society. Kick the bloodthirsty pimp from the pale of social communion. Drive such fag ends of creation as was Cain to the land of Nod. Dread such canker worms more than the pestilence that walketh in darkness and shun them as the serpent of the land and, and the shark of the sea. It, she goes on to say, resolved unanimously that Joseph Smith, the mayor of the city, be tendered our thanks for the able and manly manner in which he defended injured innocence in the late trial of O.F. Bostwick for slandering President Hiram Smith and almost all the women of the city. She goes on to say, while the marriage bed undefiled is honorable, let polygamy, bigamy, fornication, adultery, and prostitution be frowned out of the hearts of honest men to drop in the gulf of fallen nature where the worms dieth not and the fire is not quenched and let all the saints say amen. That was, sorry, that was a long one. It's a funny one to read. But then, in it, so those were during Joseph's life. But yeah, yeah. then in addition to Joseph the Third's um, final testimony of Emma that he interviewed, and I, I do think it's quite a claim to even imply that Joseph the Third would lie about his mother. Like that would be so controlling. You know, we don't have any statements of her. Like if, if she were acknowledging this to anyone, let alone William, William McClellan, she, Lucy was the closest thing she had to a mother. She absolutely would have talked to Lucy about it and she would have talked to her friends, you know, like it would be known. So it'd be strange to say that Joseph was controlling her language. But but well, anyway, we he also ha he's have- had a, He has had a multi-decade agenda at that point to suppress all of these stories and argue against them and to, to make this particular claim that he created. Uh, that was but to suppress to... his mother, to claim that his mother is trying to tell the tr that, that Joseph was a polygamist, the, what, you know, that she's trying well, to say the truth about Joseph. Well, we see him suborning, suborning the testimony of his uncle. So he he writes well, his that, uncle I very... Think that that's... <laughs> William William is a tricky guy and was a wild card. And I anyway, I have it. I have anyway. A... So unfortunately, I, he is suborning testimony, and so he's doing that with his mother as well. And she is on board with his now agenda, and so, and is prepared to, uh, you know, lie for the Lord in this way that like she yeah, did so in Nauvoo. Would be, would <laughs> so and so that, that Nauvoo for, that statements the are truth. the same. So so either so okay. so again, part of the. The situation with the Women's Relief Society, as we know, is that there is a, um, for a, a certain amount of the time, I mean, it, Emma is being deceived by Joseph Smith. In other words, so the, the extent of the polygamy that is already happening, she is totally not aware of, and she, uh, and she is being uh, lied to uh, continuously by him. At a certain point, uh, for a very brief window, she uh, is prepared to accept it, and then she later recants of that. Um, and part of what she is doing in the Women's Relief Society is trying to root out uh, uh, polygamy, and she is opposed to it. But it's also the agenda of the church to publish denials, which are false. And so that is one of the things that's happening in those in those contemporary accounts. Okay. And so I'll go on and just mention a few more of these. I, I also, when I hear people say that, it's so strange to me. If you know anything about polygamous men, no polygamous man would promote a disobedient wife to a high position and allow her to use her voice to speak against polygamy. That's that's an impossibility from, in my perspective, from everything I have seen of controlling polygamist leaders, as we uh, uh, say that Joseph is. That that would be a very strange thing for him to do. But well, but he's we also introducing have to... something and he's doing it in a and he's doing it in a surreptitious way, and so unlike um, unlike the later way polygamy is operated in Utah, where it is actual polygamy, what what Joseph Smith is doing is is having illicit relationships with women, and he is um, is creating a spiritual a secret spiritual function for it. He's created sealing, cele you know, the whole idea of celestial connections and this kind of a thing. But he is not, for example, building a giant house like uh, Brigham Young had, yeah. you know, where where everybody's all going to get to live in the house, and and he's creating a system that uh, that Emma's prepared to accept. He has started doing this completely on the sly from her and and does not want her to know about it and so and so at different times he is having i think a very good relationship with her and so in in that sense you are able to um keep that keep their um per some of their personal fighting and personal uh, issues away from their their preteen kids so uh, so they're not as aware of that so i don't think that they have actually a terrible relationship i think that they uh, they have a pretty good relationship. Actually, one of the things that um, 
Um, William Law is talking about when he's doing his later reminiscence, um, he is brought in and told about uh, the principal and so forth during that brief window when Emma is on board. And so he, in his reminiscence, is uh, thinks that she is just as terrible a, a, a person as his opinion of Joseph Smith. And so that is a very, that's why his recollection, and not a Brighamite recollect, recollection, of a, a reform Mormon who later uh, has, has lost everything and left, um, his, his recollection is very anti-Emma compared to um, other recollections where uh, where people think that Emma was you know was very much opposed to this. So it depends on the time period when when they were part of it. When, for example, um, my great 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 grandparents gave their you know fourteen year old fifteen year old daughter to um, Joseph Smith to be a plural wife. This was um, this was after so this was after the time when Hiram was originally opposed to it. <laughs> And Hiram had been running around trying to think that this was something that Bennett had started or something like that before Joseph brought him into the secret. And so and so that he talked to um, my great, great, great grandparents, eldest son, Benjamin Winchester, because they were really good friends. And so Benjamin Winchester, who later went on to become a Rigdonite apostle, he thought that Hiram was opposed to it. In other words, because of the time period when this is all happening. And so it depends on the recollection of when the person um, impacted it in Nauvoo. And so then later when when it did happen because his young sister had been part of this. He was very much opposed to the polygamy faction. And so he recognized Sidney Rigdon as a leader and he became a Rigdonite apostle and so forth. But the family um, uh, who had already been part of this went to Utah and uh, and the the patriarch of that family took on plural wives and so forth. So okay. I'm sorry. Anyway. Yeah. And it's interesting. <laughs> I I do see some similarities between William Law and, and Winchester, Benjamin Winchester that I am, will be interesting. But let me just state these. So we have um, interviews reported from Emma. The, the ones I was able to find were William Hepworth Dixon in 1869, J.C. Christensen in 1872, Jason Briggs in 1874, Mark Forscott in 1877, and then also Edmund Briggs and Harry A. Stebbins, and they're all in complete agreement. Emma gives report, like all of them give reports of conversations that they had with Emma. They completely agree. And so, um, so for example, Dixon was an English writer. He was an Englishman and a writer who was traveling through America. And he wrote, Emma, Joseph's wife and secretary, the partner of all his toils, toils and all his glories, glories, coolly, firmly, permanently denies that her husband ever had any other wife than herself. She declares the story to be false, the revelation of fraud. She denounces polygamy as the invention of Young and Pratt, a work of the devil, brought in by them for the destruction of God's new church. On account of this doctrine, she has separated herself from the saints of Utah and has taken up her dwelling with what she calls a remnant of the true church at Nauvoo. So that's one of these consistent and um, Christians, and it's an interesting name. Tell, he, tell, me, um, tell asked, me the date of that one again. I mean, it's obviously after they've reorganized the church and she's um, part of the not It is, Dixon is 69. It's published yeah. in 69. So yeah. I don't know when the interview happened. Okay. Um, and then Christensen, his interview, he says, Sister Emma, is it not a fact that your husband had other wives beside you? Emma says, no, sir. I was his only wife to my to my knowing during his lifetime. And Could by, the way, that's, had other by wives the way, that is also true to say I, it that way. <laughs> But but I know, but we have to be careful because what this, if you look at that turn of phrase, to my knowing, it, it was used in that time as my understanding is also to say, which I know for certain. To right, my but knowing. I would also like, say that... It's, that... It's, yeah, no, I'm not, not, I'm not saying it's true or knowing. I'm saying there were no other wives because these are all just affairs as, as far as uh, Emma's oh. concerned. These are not, well, not, these are not put, legitimate. Not if she... these... Okay. I'm just saying this is how you do lying for the Lord. So you 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 can say, okay, there none of these are legitimate wives. This re There was no revelation. That's a fraud. I, I, can, I can tell you there is no revelation. It's a fraud. There are no other okay. wives. This is all just affairs. So, she was well, the only legal put, wife. If she put, yeah, but if she put hands in Joseph's hand and it performed a sealing and Joseph considered them eternal wives, that's what, you know, and, and Doctrine and Covenants does say why. Right, but that's a fraud. I mean, it's actually 132. So she's so, saying okay, he did so, that yeah, and that can... was an abuse of power. That was a fraud. It wasn't a legitimate marriage. It wasn't legal and it wasn't of God. So, so, I, so I could tell you as well, from a religious standpoint, she is his only wife in any real sense there is a abuse of authority that is happening 
that where Joseph Smith is calling it a marriage, but I don't call it a marriage in any real sense. You know, I mean, it's an institution that develops later in other in the in the various factions the, the you know, when when it becomes open or at least practiced, you know, where you're having, you know, multiple women living with the same, you know, and, and, and essentially it's open within the sure. community. But all of the narratives that this is built on do very much say that they are wives. They do very much call it wives and, and right. polygamous societies consider them to be multiple wives. So Emma right. would be directly lying, even if we want to twist what she's saying. I'll, I'll finish this one quickly. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, um, he just said, could he not have had a wife without you knowing it? And he, she says, no, sir, no one had a better chance and way of knowing it than myself. Sister Emma, is it not a fact that Joseph Smith received a revelation favoring polygamy and spiritual wifery? No, sir, there was no revelation given through him on either either spiritual wifery or polygamy, nor was that abominable doctrine taught either privately or publicly by Joseph um, before his death. And so, um, oh, and then there's, and then, and then in answer to his question about the claim that she burned it, she said that is a base falsehood made out of whole cloth, which is something that she says often to that question. And so we do have many consistent testimonies from her. And William McClellan is the only one I know of that stands out in opposition to that. And then some other ones that I find similarly unreliable cons- cons- compared to her consistent testimony throughout, I think it's impossible to believe that she would have said something different to William McClellan, even though she was such a forgiving well, soul. It's, so it's earlier, that's... all of these testimonies that you're reading with the exception of the Not... contemporary ones. So the contemporary ones okay. during Joseph Smith's lifetime where the policy of the church was lying for the Lord. Then the other ones she's in keeping in with the reorganization church's new policy again of lying for the Lord. So, okay. um, so, so unfortunately, you know, so, so, so unfortunately that I agree with you. So her t- policy is pretty consistent because we now are seeing it in the, in the different um, components. And so now what she would have said in the intervening time when there is no church or when she's not part of it, when she's cast off to William McClellan, it may that you don't have to believe that she actually kept, confided any of those things with him, even in the kind of surreptitious way. He said, well, she would only nod or say yes or no, or something like that, that you, you don't have to credit that or not. It doesn't matter really. Um, okay. The issue, again, is that the policy that uh, existed when she was um, in the church, when, when Joseph Smith, her husband, was alive, was that you lie for the Lord. And one of the ways you could, all of the ones that you just barely read are ones that, unlike the last testimony, some of the things she says in that are harder to, to square in terms of this um, Clintonian, I call it Bill Clinton type style doublespeak. You know, I did not have sex with that woman, Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> because he's defining sex differently. And so he's lying yeah. in a way by saying he didn't do, he, he's defining sex one way. And so therefore he's sure. he's speaking in a way which he's saying is legally true, but but is meant to deceive you. So none of these things were yeah. taught because it's, um, because the, the, this polygamy would be an infernal doctrine. And so therefore that wasn't taught. There were no other wives because there's only one legal wife uh, and so on, you know? And so you could, those easily okay. could be that kind of, uh, lying for the Lord Clintonian statements. And it would just be that she's consistent from the church policy that she inherited. And so there's no reason for her to adopt Brigham Young's policy uh, post um, uh, whatever it is, 1852, when they, they have the open policy. So, Okay. So I did find a quote from her and I won't remember it, but where she told Brigham and Heber, she says that she told Brigham and Heber that the first two principles of their gospel are lying and deception. So, yeah. and she really, you know, so... I, I don't know that, I guess it sounds to me like there's really nothing Emma could say that could be taken, that could be, be seen as credible. Either she's lying for the Lord or, you know, so that's, so that's an interesting perspective. So, um, so like her testimony doesn't really matter, which I find ironic when we're told to believe the women and she's really well, the You already talked about believing the women. This. There's all the other women who you oh, already what? said you're not going to believe. All of no, Joseph it's Smith's not about spiritual wives. You said we're not going to believe them, even though they all gave their affidavits. You discount all of everything they're saying, and so we already said you just you were you were discounting at the beginning of this conversation. We're not going to believe the women, <laughs> you know. So no, no, I, I I want to clarify that 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 I'm saying that if we are going to believe the women, let's look at all of the women and look at their yeah. testimony and whose testimony can hold up to scrutiny the best. I don't see right. Emma. See, see, I see these women in a um, power structure that does not give them their own voice. 
right? And and for example, um, the Foster sisters, is it Sarah and Maria Foster? No, Lawrence, the Lawrence sisters, I'm sorry. Um, Sarah and Maria Lawrence, um, they are claimed to be very important wives of Joseph Smith. In fact, um, the only claim that William Law can make against Joseph Smith is with Maria Foster, but she dies in 1850. And Sarah Fo Lawrence, sorry, Sarah Lawrence comes to Utah to combat the claims that she and Joseph, she and her sister were married, were Joseph's wives. And she de denies it vehemently. And um, Emily Pratt says, oh, she's so dark now. She's lost the spirit so much that she lies about this. And we believe Emily and not Sarah. And so it's not that we're believing the women. Oh, yeah. We're not believing the women. I, so that's why I'm yeah, no, I agree. with I the agree. claim. And you so, have to believe yeah. the women. No, we don't only have to believe the women. Believe yeah, but, I'm saying but I, I guess when I, when I was even talking about it in terms of believing the women um, or not, um, the reason why I even uh, why I'd even brought that up in our pre-discussion is I meant to say as opposed to Joseph Smith, <laughs> and so oh, and the reason right. why I meant that is because I think that um, central to the um, motivation uh, of rehabilitating Joseph Smith is a um, a personal belief and picture and image that they uh, someone has of Joseph Smith, and therefore not wanting him to have committed abuses of his authority in this way. Okay. And and so and so that's all that's all I meant in terms of the the testimonies that um, so many of these women have. Not that every single any like we just have to automatically believe every single detail that any any of these women are giving um, because actually everybody is subject to the same different kinds of biases and so forth. So Emma has other kinds of reasons in addition to um, the stated policy of her church, which is, which is a avowed partisan of Brigham Young's church. Brigham Young is saying from the pulpit just horrific things about Emma. Uh, and so and so what, it's not only polygamy that she is accusing him of lying about. He, he has said hor horrific things, you know, about, about her. And she has other contexts that she is also having to deal with, which is they are now in the very height of the Victorian era. And so her and any of these women actually talking about um, personal... <laughs> Uh, intimate relationships, it is very difficult for them to even talk about, are you wife in the full sense of the word that, you know, in other words, as they're trying to get around us in terms of Victorian, um, the Victorian era. And also, also we are in a, in a time period when, because of the, um, the ending of the line for the Lord about polygamy, they're still lying for the Lord about a lot of other things out in Utah. <laughs> anyway, when, when, the, when the end of that policy happens, the, the level of hatred for Utah Mormons that happens across the planet is crazy. People don't even people don't realize the amount of um, just total hatred in the United States for for Mormons. And so right. for all of these Mormons that are living in the Midwest who didn't escape, you know, we don't even call ourselves Mormons because everyone Joseph III called himself a Mormon, you know, and all that came when the reorganization happened, the community of Christ happened. But be, after after the name Mormon became so hated because of polygamy, um, and we, Mountain we even Meadows and renounced our and Mountain Meadows Massacre and all those things. We renounced our our own name. You know, we, we now if you talk to Community of Christ, even though even though we consider Joseph the Smith Jr. to be our first prophet and we consider to be our history and all those kind of things you know we don't even call we don't we totally reject the word mormon if you ask community of christ members you know on, on your restorationist friends too you know are you are you mormons or how do they use the word mormon they use the word mormons right. to refer to people in utah only or mm -hmm. also to our ancestors sometimes you know and so okay. and so it's it, it's such a it's so it's such a crazy identity freak fugue that has happened because of the level of pressure and hatred so so for emma to be you know you know, changing the policy that she had inherited uh, from the public denials, which is what the policy was in Nauvoo, to no, yeah, now I'm going to openly admit it to everybody in the press and everything like that when it, when this is now being asked of me again on her own. I, it would be, I, I think, it would be strange for her to to start doing that, especially when it was something that she was personally had been so opposed to, and that she. Um, and it was so shameful, you know, and it was nothing, you know, it's like a, a, she'd already, the fact that, you know, her husband's name is associated with the Mormon church, you know what I mean? There's the community of Christ at a certain point is so tiny that nobody's considering us to, and anything, anything about us is we're, you know, weirdo Mormons are just lumped in with Mormons, you know? And so, and so all of this was blanketing them. So anyway, so I think it's very um, yeah. understandable why why her testimony is that way. And it's not about believing her or not believing her. It's understanding why, um, 
given where she was at, why she would make the statements in that way. Okay, which is exactly what I'm saying about the women in Utah. Because yeah. from my perspective, I think Emma is truthful. I don't think she's dissembling or lying for the Lord, but I think the women in Utah are. So it's a yeah. different, so so that's why I think it's useful to get into the nuts and bolts and, you know, at least consider what might be a possibility. But, um, oh, there's one, oh, I, and I totally agree with you with the, um, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Just the way that Mormons were viewed in Utah. And I think that help, that we need to understand that to help us understand William Law's testimony and Chester's, I mean, um, Winchester's testimony, they really were trying to distance themselves from Joseph Smith or from the foundations. I think that's a better way to understand where they were coming from. At that point, saying something good about Joseph Smith would not have been cool. So they distanced themselves as much as possible. So, um, Anyway, okay, so going on, that, let's see, there were other things I was going to, well, well can we move forward to the um, Sarah Ann Whitney sure. um, letter? And so do you want to explain that to the audience or do you want me to, I, I know most of them will know, but we can give it a quick recap. I will if you well, we, want Well, we to. sometimes, uh, I think, bring that to um, the fore and it usually gets quoted at length because it is uh, a contemporary document again. So, um, uh, it's wonderful to have, uh, you know, the aff later affidavits, but like you say, some of those affidavits are collected by the Brighamite Church. Others are um, are not, you know, in other words, so they're you you had to you had to create kind of two categories because you either are Brighamites or what you called enemies of Joseph Smith, um, and so that's a broad category that involves all kinds of different different people. Um, but in any event, that's the. Uh, one of the things that we have in terms of going back to the contemporary evidence of, of loyalists who then later become Brighamites um, are uh, this this letter that uh, is from Joseph Smith to the, the Whitney family during while he's doing this hiding out from the law and he um, is hoping to have them come and, um, and come and, and visit him. And so it is not explicit what about what it says, but what it is explicit about it is they should, they should not come to be there. He, he's saying, I've got my own room. It'll be really discreet and everything like that. But don't come if Emma's around. So if Emma's around, do not do not come, you know. And so and so therefore um, uh, it is read uh, with an implication, though. Right. So in other words, it isn't saying uh, my dearest wife, I love you and all this kind of thing. And that, uh, I can't I miss you. I want to have sex with you or something like that. But the um, the implication is not very far below the surface. And that's one of the reasons why it's read a lot, because it's contemporary. And then it is buttressed by um, a revelation dictated by Joseph Smith in Newell K. Whitney's hand. Um, and so then the question, though, then is uh, because Newell K. Whitney for people who are uh, Brighamites, he is later a loyalist to the, the Brighamite church. Um, so the question is, to what extent, you know, anyway, you trust Newell K. Whitney as a, uh, as a scribe for that kind of a revelation. And so in that case, in other words, because it's very explicit about the plural marriage between Joseph Smith and uh, his daughter. Okay. Okay. So this letter to the Whitney's, to um, Newell and Elizabeth Whitney and company, is written in Joseph's own hand, and it, to my understanding, is really the only contemporaneous piece we have written by Joseph that we can point to about his polygamy. That's the the main one I know. And then, as you said, it's buttressed by a revelation given to Newell K. Whitney that includes the marriage ceremony he is to. The right. words he's to say, like it is very explicit, tells him very what much. to say as he's marrying um, Joseph and Sarah Ann. Okay, so um, so getting into this, what I find, well, oh, I have so many questions. But as historians, is it not really important to consider the context, mm -hmm. right? Like like in in investigating this letter, shouldn't we read Joseph's journal for this time period, for example? Yes. And. And so does that shape the way you view this letter? Uh, well, and I'll come back to that. I have yeah. one more question as well. Well, I think is, that, for example, um, in um, that letter is fully quoted, for example, in George D. Smith's Nauvoo Polygamy, but we called it plural marriage or something, uh -huh. or celestial marriage. And and I think he puts even a, I think he even has a calendar of the Joseph Smith's events or whatever right around there to, in order to give it that kind of a context. Um, the place that okay. I was quoting it from was from, Todd Compton's book uh, in, in 
Sacred Loneliness, The Plural Wives of Joseph Smith. And that's one that I just recommend everyone to read. You know, we're talking about um, uh, getting into interested in the lives of the women involved, uh, whether they become Brighamites or not, and however much you want to believe them. At least you can also um, understand the struggles of early Latter-day Saint women and pioneers. And we don't often get to see those kind of biographies. And so the fact that uh, Todd Compton, you know, put gathered those stories together is is really worth reading. So I so I think Todd Compton is one of the best guys. He is such a nice guy. I super appreciate that he did this, um, the, the biographies of the women. I one thing that I did push back with him on when I talked to him, I don't like when historians state things as factual, they state their narrative as factual. And I think that that's one that's like, I absolutely say yes, read that book with the caveat of understanding that he is stating factual things that are based in very um, questionable evidence from my perspective. So um, but so, so, so when one of the I'm things that happens, I'll just say one of the things that happens, and this is also, like I said, the case when I just talked about this right at the beginning with the historical Jesus, right? So there is a big difference between, um, if you're going to go through and just make the case where we can say, thus, it has been demonstrated. There was a historical Jesus. There is a big difference from that argumentative case. Once that's been demonstrated, now, now we can go back and look at the, the general sources, understanding that there's a historical Jesus. Now we can, what can we say about this historical Jesus? And we can say more about the historical Jesus than things that are being said about him or whether they're not proofs that he existed. They are given that we know that he existed. This is what we now can say on him based on the sources that we have. And so what I would say mm-hmm. that suggests that Todd is doing is not every single part of this is a a book that is a proof Joseph Smith was a polygamist. That has already been conclusively shown by all of the evidence taken, the preponderance of evidence, the fact that this is the the most likely narrative because the evidence is so great, both contemporaneous, before, after, people who are Brighamites, people who are, you call enemies of Joseph Smith, but in other words, people who are insiders who break with him, um, people who uh, continue in other factions, uh, people, and, and who continue to be therefore loyal to Joseph Smith, people who like Benjamin Winchester, even if they're not loyal to Joseph Smith, have no loyalty to Brigham Young. They hate Brigham Young, you know, and so could have, if Brigham Young was the origin of it, he'd be very happy to have said so. So once we already have, have that, um, the preponderance of evidence, in other words, where historians have established that Joseph Smith is a polygamist, now mm-hmm. you now we are telling the story based on uh, you know, what, what can, how can we understand it, you know, based on the other evidence? And so, and so that all I would just suggest to you, it isn't, this, this entire book is not a, every single argument that he's making about reconstructing lives that we can't know as much about. Right. So my great, 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 great grandparents, daughter, who is married to Joseph Smith, Nancy Mariah Winchester, almost nothing is known about her other than our, our, our brief family, um, remembrances and so forth. You know, we don't have a lot of those documents that like of this letter, (laughs) you know, we don't have, um, we don't have a revelation that Joseph Smith dictated to my great grandfather. We don't have anything. We don't have any writings from my great, great, great grandfather, you know, he, uh, and so as a result of that, um, it's not a proof. Todd Compton, in order to create that has had to, um, you know, women are not always as, uh, don't always have as much of a role in history and make the documents in terms of so that we can reconstruct those lives. And so, and so that, so if we only had my family's reminiscence, we wouldn't be able to prove a thing about (laughs) Joseph Smith and polygamy, right? In other words, because it's only in the context of the rest of the evidence that we can try to tease out Nancy's story. And so, and so that's what happened there. Okay, so so yes, but the interesting thing is usually Todd Compton's book is used as the authoritative source and the proof. That's how, like, even when I um, was contacting the church library, the um, church family history library, and asking for documents and information, even they, their recommendation was read Brian Hale's book and read Todd Compton's book if you want to know about <laughs> Joseph's polygamy. So, so what I'm saying is we have these narratives, but we haven't done the due diligence to question the assumptions underlying them. And I think that work needs to be done. So that's what I'm trying to engage in now. But yeah. I want to go. No, I can agree with you that, that we don't maybe have a text that somebody has um, written what, you know, some historian would have to take it upon themselves to do that thing that I was talking about doing in terms of proving the existence of the historical Jesus, where I have an art, I have a, I have a lecture that I did just that, right? 
And I don't normally do that. I'm normally talking about all that we can know about the historical Jesus. And so I, I could agree with you that that probably hasn't been done. And the reason why it hasn't been done is because until you and all of the growing number of people who are, uh, are coming at it from the direction you are, it has not been necessary to do that because the um, it's been demonstrated to the satisfaction of all the historians. And so therefore, nobody's had to argue that we've already come to a place where we're now trying to explain it and so forth. Okay. Um, but and so, okay, so, so I agree with you that maybe that book should be that. written. Okay, yeah. good. Well, I, hopefully it, it will be. So, so yeah. I just want to move on. I know we've been talking for a while. So are we okay to go on to Sarah and Whitney? And, and yeah, uh, yeah. So, so one thing I find interesting is you, you said that the revelation is in Newell K. Whitney's hand. Have you seen that? So, so I uh, was, I think, I think I was quoting Todd for that. I have seen it. I looked it up on the Joseph Smith papers, but I didn't, but, um, but I didn't necessarily see what the Joseph Smith paper said, whose hand it is. So has it, is it in somebody okay. else's hand? So what we have on the Joseph Smith papers, which is the most authoritative source that we have access to, we have yeah. a 1912 typewritten copy that that is what was presented to Joseph F. Smith when he requested it from the family. And then the only other two sources we have are two manuscript copies that the Joseph Smith papers just says are circa 19, 1870 with no, um, no explanation as to why they're 1870. It just, we have okay. two handwritten copies by unknown writers in 1870, it says. And then, but the typewritten copy is the only, is the one that was used. To, to base this. So I, I would be curious to know which came first, where did they, you know, so we actually, and this was never mentioned at all until, oh, shoot, I have it here. I'll have to find it. I believe it wasn't mentioned until I want to say it was 1865, but I might have that year wrong. I'll have to find it was the first time that a revelation was even mentioned. And it was later than that. I'll find it. And it was, there was, um, man, I've got to find my notes, published in a newspaper that um, that this revelation existed but had never been published. But what's really interesting is that before that newspaper article that said that um, it, it existed, um, Elizabeth Ann Whitney had written her autobiography, which was carried, so it was much later than that. I will find the dates. But her autobiography was carried in the women's exponent. It's called a leaf from a page, a leaf from an autobiography, I believe, and it starts in November of 1878. And she, not only does she never mention that revelation, which I would think would be a pretty important revelation because it's you know she's involved in it and it's very important, mm -hmm. but the the story she gives in the autobiography directly contradicts the story in the um the the revelation they can't both be true and so i think that is very as high a highly questionable source to use because we have to again the context elizabeth ann whitney absolutely would have mentioned it and so in elizabeth ann whitney's autobiography she says that it was when bishop whitney had the copy made of of section 132 that she she read it and they fasted and prayed until they were willing to give their daughter to joseph in the revelation mm -hmm. that was given in 1842 a year earlier i can't remember what month off the top of my head um i'll think of it maybe july but um but it said that this what you have agreed to is right so it says that they had already agreed to give elizabeth and whitney so i see no reason to not assume that this is also a later reproduction at some point in the utah period either um you know, like like some people hypothesize that it was Heber C. Kimball who came up with it, which is part of the reason that if it does, ex I mean, if it wasn't just created in 1912 or in 1870, if it was copied from something, they're not releasing what that was. It obviously made it across the plains if it was able to be copied in 1870. And most, some people really think it would be a Newell K. Whitney's handwriting based on misspellings, based on using initials and words. So, so I wanted to point out, this is a highly, highly questionable source. And okay. my- well so like I say, for that one, like I, I, what I probably was doing was pulling uh, because of the letter, you know, and uh, and and so and because, again, this is um, something that I'm pulling out of Todd Compton's book. Um, so in this particular case, I appreciate that we you know, go through and and uh, again, 
look at every individual document, which is really important to do. Um, and it may well be um, that a late reminiscence that somebody has, you know, you're making an argument that that late reminiscence for their autobiography, um, where they that you're that would be a negative evidence, right? That that she would have remembered this or that would have been important. Well, you know, and people don't always remember how it all, you know, you know what all the order of things are. So I don't, I don't, we would have to make the argument about that in, in particular case. Like I say, I didn't have that in the way because I'm not, um, I am not actually a frontline historian in terms of the person who is, uh, let's say, looking at every one of these documents in the, um, in order to create a book like Todd Compton, Todd Compton will have been doing that. I, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not doing that because it's not, that's not my, my focus that's of what I work on, <laughs> you know, but right. I'm instead... <laughs> Taking taking what is in the in that case uh, secondary sources, and um, helping people understand why historians have gotten to that place, and so sure. so I appreciate okay. that we can talk about every particular individual um, piece of the different evidence. The reason why I'll tell you that I I used the the letter. The letter is pretty compelling, you know, because it is a uh, contemporary, um, and this other document, like I say when I even introduced it to, to you, I was saying, you know, purports to anyway be from the time, whether, but like you say, it depends on our understanding of it because of it coming through the, the Brighamite tradition, which is itself yeah. biased and pro-polygamy. It wouldn't be, I, I find it un, high, highly unlikely that it would be something that would be, be created in, in like 1912 because they're not in favor of polygamy at that point. But anyway, in any yeah, event, was... but if you're talking about, um, again, is is the Brighamite church prepared to forge evidence in the 1860s and 1870s and 1850s even? Yes, of course they are. So, and so all the way I, up into yeah. the 1840s. Yeah, the late 1840s and early 1850s. Because Yeah, think yeah that all through that time period. Yeah. Um, Brigham, mm -hmm. Brigham Young, in my opinion, doesn't have any legitimate claim to for his coup. And he has okay. to justify his coup in a bunch of different ways, you know. So. Yeah. So okay. So I found this. So so the the Joseph Smith papers say that the earliest we have is 1870. Those two manuscript copies. Okay. We don't know who they're by. Then it was mentioned for the first time. It was in the Contributor, which I can show in January 1885 is the first time it says there's this revelation that's never been published, but it exists. So and I guess the, the the, what I had seen on the paper on the on the Joseph Smith papers is in fact the letter that not the not the purported revelation. Right. right? So that's right. that's what have... I was surprised. I was surprised by the letter being on there. So because I had never looked at it. Oh, I no, read the it back. Letter. Yeah. The letter. So that that's what I guess I had seen on the Joseph Smith papers. Not that I hadn't looked up the revelation. I'd looked up the letter. So Okay, so so then let's talk about the letter. Because I think so I hope that you like understand why I see it's interesting you say the experts in this topic, because really Todd Compton wasn't an expert either. He was an ancient historian, you know, and he was really surprised he was given the grant to study the um yeah. the journals. And so he's also, you know, so he also was based, had this assumption when he did his work. So really the prices who I know you say they've been debunked, but I don't like, I don't think most people have even read them and considered the amount of information well, they the have book. dealt with it. You have I read, read them? the book. Yes. Okay. They will all, because all because them, this became to... such a issue because of the, uh, because of the remnant, um, you know, the, the gathering of the, whatever the remnant movement is called, you know, the Snufferite movement, because this became such a big issue all the way back in like the 2000s. Um, uh, I went and got, you know, Joseph fought polygamy and I, and I read through it and so forth so that I could be able to see what, what was being presented there. But yeah. Okay. I think that's good. Cause I think it's like, like um, if, I, I mean, I don't know that you want to speak to people like me. I don't know. Like you said, I don't know if that's your expertise or your wheelhouse that you want to um, present on Joseph's polygamy, but since you are presenting on it, it would be good to know what the issues are, you know, because, because you're saying it with such certainty. And that's why I like started with that feeling that when the historians speak, this thinking has been done because no, it's that not perspective that way, doesn't feel. So but... it's the dismissal, it's the dismissal of whole swashes of evidence. So in other words, if you're going to like the prices dismiss anything that Brigham Young touched and everything that is an enemy of Joseph, well, then suddenly you're left with no, you know, you're not left with any honest evidence. And so, the, yeah, and so, so as, because all you have is Joseph Smith lying and, and yeah. all of the other, and, and so, and so that's, and so that gives you, that paints you into the picture place that you want to be. So, and that's kind of, you know. Well, so to clarify for me, 
Um, like I, I'm not about dismissing evidence. I'm about investigating it. So for example, no, the know, Whitney I revelation, I, I the, think that's the worth investigating. Yeah. I'm at and, the uh, yeah. And I have, yeah. So, um, so anyway, the, the thing that I find interesting with the letter is, um, so I have to link, I'll link in the show notes, Rob Fotheringham, who you might know because he's, he's made videos on this topic quite a bit and he did an excellent one on Sarah and Whitney and, um, and this situation. So I get some of this and quite a bit of this information from him, but um, it's interesting to consider the situation, the context again of that letter that I think helps us interpret it in much more um, accurate ways. Right. And so Joseph at this time, as you said, was in hiding because of the murder attempt on governor Boggs. Right. And so the, the, mobs were trying, I mean, the, the Missourians were trying to find him, which they all knew would be a death sentence if they found him. So his, it was very serious that he was in hiding. Yeah. Right. And, yes. um, he also, I just think it's interesting because, you know, he's an extrovert. He's like, he didn't have yeah. a computer. Like this would have been a miserable, miserable time. Right. He wanted, he, he would have craved seeing people. And so, yeah. um, Anyway, and so I guess I'm curious to know, first of all, do you have any evidence that Joseph and Emma were struggling in their relationship at this time or that he was, you know, other than just the narrative that makes you think I'm not that making he... any claim that Joseph and Emma are struggling. I don't. Okay. Oh, he okay. doesn't want Emma to know that they're going to come visit because he's having a clandestine relationship with Newell K. Whitney's daughter. Yeah. And, and so, 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 so it's so not the because letter... they're struggling. They're not, he, he very happy to visit with Emma. He's saying Emma might come some other time. And because, because, because she's coming to visit him because they're, they're getting along just fine. I don't, I don't have this Brigham Young, uh, uh, narrative where Emma was a hell hellion and trying to poison him and all of this, all these dumb Brigham Young lies. So I think that they okay. are, are very good partners, but Joseph Smith is also abusing his authority on the side, on the sly in this way and deceiving her about it. And so um, that's, okay. that's why. Okay, that's so interesting. That's interesting because the whole narrative we get of Joseph being um, deceptive and and this polygamy comes from the same source that Brit, that Emma as this crazy lady comes from. You know, it's all, it is all based in the William Clayton journals. And so it's interesting to dismiss part of them and not, you know, you know, to take part of the narrative and, and dismiss well, part they of did the have, narrative. They definitely have fights. She's opposed to this polygamy. Right. Quick interruption, and then we'll get back into the conversation. I realized that it would be important for the listeners to understand exactly what letter we're talking about. So I'm going to read the letter written in Joseph Smith's own hand, marked August 18th by William Clayton. Dear and beloved brother and sister Whitney and etc. Now first, please note it's addressed to beloved brother and sister Whitney and others. It doesn't actually ever say Sarah Ann's name. The assumption we have that this is Sarah Ann Whitney is based upon, again, the later testimonies that I believe were built around this letter. I take this opportunity to communicate some of my feelings privately at this time, which I want you three eternally to keep in your own bosoms. For my feelings are so strong for you since what has passed lately between us that the time of my absence from you seems so long and dreary that it seems as if I could not live long in this way. And if you three would come and see me in this my lonely retreat, treat, it would afford me great relief of mind. If those with whom I am allied do love me, now is the time to afford me succor in the days of exile. For you know I foretold you of these things. I am now at Carlos Granger's, just back at Brother Hiram's farm. It is only one mile from town. The nights are very pleasant indeed. All three of you can come and see me in the fore part of the night. Let Brother Whitney come a little ahead and knock at the southeast corner of the house at the window. It is next to the cornfield. I have a room entirely by myself. The whole matter can be attended to with the most perfect safety. Again, please note that the theme of this letter is how they can get there to visit him in safety without threatening his life by giving away his location. I know it is the will of God that you should comfort me now in the time of affliction or not at all. Now is the time or never, but I have no need of saying any such thing to you, for I know the goodness of your hearts and that you will do the will of the Lord when it is made known to you. The only thing to be careful of is to find out when Emma comes, then you cannot be safe. But when she is not here, there is 
the most perfect safety. Only be careful to escape observation as much as possible, right? That's the theme of the letter. You can't be seen coming to visit me and give away my hiding place. I know it is a heroic undertaking, but so much the greater friendship and the more joy. When I see you, I will tell you all my plans. I cannot write them on paper. Burn this letter as soon as you read it. Keep all locked up in your breasts. My life depends upon it. And who is his life in danger from? From Emma or from the Missourians? One thing I want to see you for is to get the fullness of my blessing sealed upon our heads, etc. You will pardon me for my earnestness on this subject when you consider how lonesome I must be. Your good feelings know how to make every allowance for me. I close my letter. I think Emma won't come tonight. If she don't, don't fail to come tonight. I subscribe myself your most obedient and affectionate companion and friend, Joseph Smith. Now back to the conversation. So, um, so anyway, that week, so we don't actually have a date on that letter. William Clayton later wrote in on the top of it, August 18th. And so I think it's interesting to look at this week because, um, we know from the journal entries and the letters at this time period that Emma was being closely followed by these people, these Missourians trying to find Joseph Smith. They had to do all kinds of different surreptitious decoys and, you know, send a a carriage that way and send one this way, send a writer that way. And Emma got on a carriage part of the way, then walked at night because she was being so closely followed. Hmm. Right. And Hmm. so wouldn't that be a very logical explanation of why um, they needed to watch out for Emma? No. Because, okay. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. No, it's not. That's not what the, I don't think that I read the letter that way at all. So no. So I read, I read a letter to two parents. It's addressed to Newell and Elizabeth Whitney. Yes. And the idea, and, and Joseph has one room in someone else's house. Right. And he's arranging a booty call with the parents who are going to be there while it occurs. That's right. And that seems more likely to you knowing that Emma was being closely followed and that Emma was likely there when this letter was written and may have even been the one who delivered it because she was delivering letters for I, Joseph. I, in, if, if, if um, Emma would have delivered a letter like this, which I, I, I doubt that a letter like this, which even says on it, I think, burn this letter later, <laughs> you know, don't, don't save this right, letter. But do you know why it's, why do you think it it's says that, burn this letter? So that uh, again, this kind of these kinds of clandestine communications are not uh, coming to light, and so certainly so, so that Emma doesn't get a hold of these these kind of letters. And so I again, Joseph is deceiving his wife about these relationships, and so and so what I I don't think that anybody is going through the the risky. I mean, a risky behavior of having her actually deliver them like Rosengrantz and Gildenstern style letters, if, unless you really trust that she never opens letters. Um, so no, I, but yeah. So on the night of the 17th, so we, I don't know what day this letter was written. William Clayton adds the 18th, yeah, he had which the 18th, may be exactly. because there's not a journal entry on the 18th. I, 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 I know that William Clayton was going through sources to craft his narrative. That's, that's something we've looked into very deeply, but, um, but on the in the, the middle of the night on the 17th, they moved Joseph in his place of hiding. Emma was with him. Emma came to tell him that his hiding place had been discovered and that he needed to immediately move. And that's when he went. Is it the Grangers that he went to? I can't remember what the letter says, but both his yeah. journal and the letter are, are in agreement in that. And in the and so his hiding place is very important. And in the letter, he says, I am at this place burn this letter okay yeah so that would also be a good that'd be a good reason also to burn it so in other words he he is in hiding and so therefore he does not want this correspondence to get out his hiding place he doesn't want to get out but in terms of emma being with him or not the letter is also very clear like you say that emma is often going to be able to be at this hiding place so so the issue is not that he's apart from emma he is sometimes apart from emma and that's when he wants them to visit Okay. Okay. Except, so Emma also said, so we have letters going back and forth between Joseph at this time as well. So she comes and visit, hits him twice, once on the 11th, and there's that meeting on the island, and Newell K. Whitney is there, and Emma is there, and Hiram's there. Emma's the only woman there. And Joseph writes about his feelings that night. And so I think it's on, in his, that meeting happened on the 11th, and in his journal on the 16th, 
It says, with what unspeakable delight and what transports of joy swelled my bosom when I took by the hand on that night my beloved Emma, she that was my wife, even the wife of my youth and the choice of my heart. Many were the rever reverberations of my mind when I contemplated for a moment the many scenes we had been called to pass through, the fatigues and the toils, the sorrows and sufferings and the joys and consolations from time to time had strewn our paths and crowned our board. Oh, what a commingling of thought filled my mind for the moment. Again, she, here, again, she is here, even in the seventh trouble, undaunted, firm, and unwavering, unchangeable, affectionate Emma. So he yeah. wrote that on the 16th. On the 17th, she comes, she's also with him all day, I believe, on the 14th. And they talk about, you know, they, they got to have that time together. On the 16th, he writes this. On the 17th, in the middle of the night, she comes and moves him. And on the 18th, he's arranging a tryst. Yes. That, that's what we claim. Okay. And, and, and it's based only nothing, in that interpretation. I don't interpretation think there's anything that... uncomfortable with, I'm sorry to say, with that timeline, even as you've outlined it. Because like you said, it's, we're not sure. But let's say, let's say that that date is correct, that is added, and that's the timeline. And he is even having those positive thoughts about Emma and his... Uh, his partnership with her, that is not precluding um, these relationships that he is having with these other women. And so okay. what exactly he feels about those and what exactly the point of those is, is and so forth, but that is not, that's not precluding him doing that. So, so okay. it is not, uh, I agree that there is a, um, an attempt by uh, Brigham Young, who is a big enemy of Emma and Emma's big enemy of Brigham Young, Brigham Young's not even an important person at this point in 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 Nauvoo, I would say. You know, he is. No, he um, wasn't there at that meeting with Joseph yeah. on the eleventh. Yeah, I mean, I mean, all of these statues that the LDS make of Brigham Young and and Joseph Smith is giving him the plans to go west and all this nonsense. Um, you know, my um, we have like a in the recollection from Benjamin Winchester, um, at, you know, at this time, uh, uh, he uh, uh, apparently. Uh, um, Joseph Smith said to my great, 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 great grandmother, this is hearsay, it's just what Benjamin Winchester says. He says that uh, if Brigham Young ever gets a hold of this church, he'll he'll lead it to hell, he says to her. Yeah, you know, we have um, a lot of accounts of that. And um, and and I don't believe necessarily that that <laughs> that he told my great, great grandmother that because I'm not sure that Joseph Smith would have imagined that somebody as low and unimportant as Brigham Young would ever get a hold of a church because he's just, in my opinion, he's sort of like the head of Joseph Smith's dirty tricks people, you know, so when Joseph Smith wants to do um, bad things like uh, assassinate uh, Boggs or any other illegal thing, he's got a, co a coterie of, of these yes men like Brigham Young who do the bad stuff for him. Um, but I don't think that he would have thought of that guy as ever taking over, you know, so. Okay. Okay. So I, I want to throw this in because I thought, thought it was interesting. So this isn't a directly applicable, but um, some people have said to me that because Joseph's um, journal entry says the wife of my youth, that he's differentiating Emma from his other wives. But I think it's interesting to recognize Joseph was so familiar with the Bible, right? He was quoting the Old Testament. It's Proverbs 5, 18, which, is, which talks about the wife of your, of your youth and explicitly says, like, Ban it bans you from having relationships with anyone other than the wife of your youth. So I think it's interesting that that was the scripture that he referred to in um, in in that letter. But another, so there are a couple of other points along these lines that I think are interesting because I see I see what you're saying that you are go you interpret this letter this way, but it's based all we have is the letter and it's just our interpretation of it. Sure. Right. And especially when we recognize that the revelation is so highly problematic. And right. like I, I, I feel comfortable saying it's absolutely a forgery because Elizabeth Whitney would have known about that revelation. What, so but whether it is that, or not, but... it's actually not not in the end relevant to the again, the, the preponderance of evidence. So the, the letter well, again... is read consonant to all of the evidence that we have contemporary and then later of everybody based on all of their different, um, you know, biases, uh, pro and, and against, and often very anti Brigham Young, you know? And so, and so that's yeah, why, so, letters... so that's why, like, you know, you're talking about it and you say, well, I'm reading it this way because the, uh, because he's writing this love letter to Emma. Well, he doesn't have to be on the outs with Emma or hating Emma to be engaged uh, in this system because he can have justified it to himself in any number of ways that he's doing it. He's, um, 
he is definitely now by this point made it a system so that he is justifying it religiously even. And it is also involving women who are older, who he's probably not having physical relationships with, but it um, is a lot of people have tried to like Richard Bushman have tried to suggest, well, what really this is like, it's dynastic and so forth. And so when, um, you know, when we're, we're, we're saying it in a, in a very negative way, you know, when he's talking to the presiding bishop of the church and arranging a booty call or whatever is how you're characterizing it. And I'm saying, sure, we can call it that, but this is also, um, they've been sold to it. The idea that, uh, that they are now, their family is being sealed to Joseph Smith's, um, family and in and himself specifically uh in the eternities as he is now going to essentially being an exalted god man or something like that and they are going to be brought into those glories with him and that would have been the same reason why my great 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 grandparents also as a couple will have given their daughter to joseph smith to be a plural wife so in other words it's not um it's not out of he's not doing it without talking to the parents um, in this case, his parents are insiders, you know, like Heber Kimball okay. or whatever. He he propositions, um, you know, Heber's wife or whatever a couple times. So, you know, pr or propositions Heber to give him his wife a couple times, which doesn't happen, but it's like a loyalty test. And then he gets the daughter, right? And so forth. Right. According to Heber's later reminiscence. But let me go on with right. this, um, this le these letters. And then this is the last piece of evidence I'll talk about in this one. Yeah. So um, this is um, August 16th. Emma wrote a, um, Joseph wrote a letter that says, my dear Emma, I embrace this opportunity to express to you some of the feelings. So the 16th, right? We say the letter is written the 18th. She was there yeah. all day the 14th, right? They moved him on the 17th. So this is the 16th I wanted to. Um, first of all, I take the liberty to tender you my sincere thanks for the two interesting and consoling visits that you have made, made me during my almost exiled situation. Tongue cannot express the gratitude of heart for the warm and true, true hearted friendship you have manifested in these things towards me. That that it goes forward. Brother Miller again suggested to me the propriety of me accompany of my accompanying him to the pine woods, and then he return and bring you and the children. My mind will eternally revolt at every suggestion of that kind. My safety is with you if you want to have it so. Anything more or less than this cometh of evil. If I go to the pine country, you shall go with me and the children. And if you and the children go not with me, I don't go. I do not wish to exile myself for the sake of my own life. I would rather fight it out. It is for your sakes, therefore, that I would do such a thing. I will go with you then in the same carriage, for I am not willing to trust you in the hands of those who cannot feel the same interest for you that I feel. I think if I could have a res respite for about six months with my family, it would be a savor of life unto me. Tell the children that all is well with their father as yet, and that he remains in fervent prayer to the Almighty God. Um, Almighty God, for the safety of himself and for you and for them. Tell Mother Smith that it shall be well with her son. Yours in haste, your affectionate husband until death through all eternity forevermore, Joseph Smith. And the thing that I think is particularly interesting, I know you can hear that and just say, sure, he's duplicitous. He's saying this to Emma Wilde. No, no, I'm saying he things. loves his wife. But, he loves his children. Yes. And he's Absolutely. also, he's also making arrangements with her saying, I want to be yeah. with you and stay with you and we'll, I'll go Absolutely. where you go. Yeah. If I, I have to escape to the pineries, if I go to go to Wisconsin, I don't want to go alone. I'm going to go with you guys because I want to take you to be with me. And I, you know, because I, and not just for any duplicitous reason, it's because I, you know, I'm in love with you and I love their family and I love the kids, you know? So I, I, I don't think that he's in this place where this is happening as a result of him hating Emma or something like that. None of this is about, um, not liking Emma. Like I would even say, uh, um, William Law's uh, recollections are, are in fact that they're in it together because of that brief period that he's introduced to this is when, when Emma's temporarily on board for a second about this. But it's not because of, uh, it's not because of a bad partnership that he has with Emma that this is happening. And certainly by the okay. end, I think, uh, even though, again, and like you say, uh, Emma later in her um, testimony denies this burning of the of the revelation or the document. Uh, I think personally, the that at a certain point he realized what a foolish thing that he had been doing uh, in the end of his life, and that they um, burned this thing together. He took no new uh, marriages, and he was going to do the same thing that he did with John C. Bennett, which is to say, after the heat had gotten high, he was going to root it out of the church. He was going to make Brigham Young his scapegoat. 
and he and he was going to get enlist William Marks in order to scapegoat Brigham Young. And if he, if Brig, and if Joseph Smith, how do you lived, know he was going to? How do you know he was going to make Brigham Young his scapegoat? I just am curious about. Oh, I just know that's a speculation. That this William... is speculation. I'm sorry, I'm speculating. So my, so at this point, I'm saying he's going to make somebody a scapegoat. <laughs> And so, and so, and so, somebody's got to take the fall. Like John C. Bennett took the fall. John C. Bennett had been his best friend, but anyway, at this point, John C. Bennett had to take the fall on the first time around. And so now, you know, the head of his um, yes men, these guys that are doing his, you know, all of Joseph Smith's stealing for the Lord and all those kind of things, Brigham Young. Um, I'm just saying he's the he's the head guy whose head is likely to roll. It, that's just my. You know, my guess okay. of who he picked to take the fall. That has nothing to do. But 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 I do think that what he, he he definitely tells, I think, William Marks, we've got to root this out of the church. And uh, and he realizes that, you know, this this whole path has been wrong. And so that's how I I I take Joseph Smith. And it's not because of a, a bad partnership with Emma or anything like that. And I actually when you read that love letter, um, one of the one of the saddest parts of of um um, I don't know, the Brighamite tr tradition is, is if you just think about it, like for, for Joseph Smith, I mean, if, as you, I think you have a high opinion of Joseph Smith and like him and, and think back of him as the founder of this movement and who you'd like to have, you know, you, you think positively of, right? Just think of this incredible betrayal of the Brighamite people in terms of ripping the whole institution away from this family who's then left, right? You know, and so if you can imagine Joseph Smith, if he would have ever have said, oh yeah, let's just, let's give this church structure to Brigham Young and leave my my son alone, you know, <laughs> destitute here or whatever in the, in the, in the Midwest. I mean, and so in that way, I also, um, I don't know, wonder when we go back and look at these things, why then more, more people who are where you're at don't then want to look at community of Christ and the actual inheritance of um, Emma and the Smith family that what Joseph Smith would have wanted um, uh, as a, as a different yeah. alternative. So, <laughs> well, my, my perspective at this point is, and, and you might not like to hear this, but I think that the community of Christ has betrayed Emma and Joseph Smith III in the same way that Brigham Young did it. it that's what makes me, like the Doctrine and Covenants we have, I think it's section 122, I'll have to look it up, but it says that thy friends will not be um, convinced by the testimony of traitors. And, and that's what makes me sad is I think that you know, one of the biggest arguments in favor of Joseph's polygamy is that the RLDS church, or now the community of Christ, has gone along with this narrative. But I, I did an episode on that. And and so for me, it wouldn't be like I do. I do believe we have a lot of problems in our history. Brigham Young is a very problematic and troubling figure. I, you know, I think that most of the Smith family was killed um, because like um, for a, the sake of a hostile takeover. Right. And I think it's tragic. And so it's sad to me to see Joseph and Emma's legacy church also go the same direction. That's And that's why I wanted to bring up because because when you're talking to me, I hear you um, continually repeat the narrative, but I'm wanting the sources. I'm wanting the documents. And all we have is this Whitney letter. And I would no. say if we look at like... Like well, well, we could we maybe we could talk again, or we could do some more correspondence and bring up some other evidences because I would be very open to seeing them. The only things that I have seen are um, much better interpreted in a different way with a better context. Like um, you know, like I, I read to you the the changing of the documents, the changing of the history, cutting uh, of our tradition in the LDS Church when they prepared the. Um, the history not only did they change things they just cut things out they cut, sure, you know and so they have like like our history includes john c bennett's claims we have that happiness letter as a true part of our history and we've cut out joseph and hiram's own words and own publications that's shocking to me and as i see it go forward i'm like let's really look at this from a clean slate instead of wearing this brighamite baggage and that has been pushed forward again and again repeatedly we can look at this and and with fresh eyes and say what do we actually have what is the actual evidence and what is the most likely conclusion within the context that that we have for it and we can set aside the later claims for not that we not that we don't take them seriously but we should investigate them like for example elizabeth whitney claimed 
that her daughter was married to Joseph Smith, but it doesn't match up with anything that we have, right? And I know that you um, dismiss the problem of no children, but for me, I, I have done deep research into the um, contraceptive knowledge in that day, and it convinces me that it is impossible to believe that he would not have children. And I did another, I had um, a fellow come on who's done a statistical analysis of the probability. And Benjamin Winchester, your own great, great, great grandfather, claims that, um, who was it? Louisa Beeman, that Joseph came and visited her at least once a week in his own home. So we have tricky claims if we're going to say, you know, we can't make this all work. Well. So that so in terms of contraception, already in that time period, for example, the whole nation of France's population stabilized. So so one of the things that is happening is that people are able to, you know, we don't have the modern pill. We don't have that sort of contraception where we have, um, you know, systems that are always working. But if you are absolutely trying not to have kids, like Joseph Smith is trying not to have kids. So unlike Brigham Young and so forth, and and also, frankly, the the justifications for polygamy, which are to raise up a righteous seed and all those kind of things that are maybe worked into the apologetics of why Joseph Smith is doing it. He is not wanting to have kids, and so I think that that is shown by. And again, I want to ask what evidence you have that for isn't. that. It's can shown I, by the fact that there me? aren't any. <laughs> and so, right. and so, so. That's so a in other words, so, so therefore he's not trying. In other words, if 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 he wanted to have a bunch of kids, he could have had a bunch of kids because he's fertile, right? And so and yeah. so and so there, so there's no reason to imagine that he wants to have a lot of kids. And so and so he has a practice of spiritual wifery, whatever you want to call it, celestial marriage, plural marriage, where he is being sealed to all of these women. And the women are giving affidavits in many cases after the fact, you know, like you say later, where they're saying that it was a, every kind of uh, you know, every kind of wife or relationship. In other words, a physical relationship. Uh, but uh, but what we'd also have contemporaneously is, um, for example, when they're when they're making uh, scapegoating Bennett. You know, one of the things that they say about him is that he was an abortionist, that he was involved in in buggery. And so um, so people have said that that's a charge of Bennett being a homosexual. But actually, buggery can refer to all non-vaginal intercourse, right? And so one of the ways that you don't have children is by you have other kinds of manual, oral, whatever, these other kinds of of, of sex, like we talked about Bill Clinton at the beginning of this in Clintonian line. So, so, so in other words, there's that way of having sex and the, the way of reproduction that also prevents children having is abortion. And so the um, it's hard to hear that in a modern LDS context where people have really adopted the evangelical uh, position on abortion, but the original position taught by uh, the church in the 1840s is that um, that the spirit only comes into the baby in the quickening, you know, at the moment of the quickening. And this is why, um, for example, even in Saturday's Warrior, um, when it, the, Emily is going to be born and there's a miscarriage. It's not that Emily, the spirit, was already in that miscarried fetus. She gets in the next fetus, you know, and so forth, because the original, um, anyway, the idea is, is that the spirit enters either in the quickening or at birth. And so that was a different Mormon position, which would have justified abortion. So, um, okay. So I've, I have a lot of thoughts on all of this. Well, well, first of all, I think it would be worthwhile to, if, if you want to watch my episode on um, the insurmountable problem of no children, because I did a deep investigation of, of um, the knowledge of contraceptive contraception at this time. And we can yeah. look, we have a very clear history of it. It's worth yeah, it's exploring bad. before yeah. we... Before we make these claims, before we claim that they could have the, the that John Bennett was a capable abortionist, I think it's worth exploring that. But um, what's more is that we claim that these are Victorian women who would be very embarrassed about saying they were Joseph's wife in very deed, and yet we are saying that they were engaging in anal sex. Right that's bizarre to me, like completely bizarre to me to like, it, so this so there's is a where, big difference between me, a public, a... what you're willing to say to the public and a, in a affidavit in court or in a, in a published newspaper and what you're able or willing to do when the prophet of your church who 
is every single thing else to you um, is telling you or instructing you whatever you're doing. So. Yeah, I think I think that's quite a claim to make. And again, it's only we have access to the same. It's only based on a choice, on an interpretive choice. You see the evidence of no children and go to anal sex and 1840s abortion. I see the choice of no children, uh, the evidence of no children and say the possibility that Joseph Smith, Emma Smith, Hiram Smith, all of them were telling the truth in their consistent story and that Brigham Young and the later dedicated polygamist who we know fudged history completely and we know lied repeatedly about everything, lied about Joseph Smith because they needed to have the validation that this was Joseph's church. And so I think that that is a completely plausible explanation and not only plausible, but is a much better explanation for all of the evidence that we have. Like we it's know not. that Emma was being followed in the Whit the Whitney letter is the only thing I know of that's contemporaneous. No. And so even I mean, it John doesn't matter Bennett, if it's only contemporaneous. I'm sorry. Contemporaneous is not the whole of the historical record. You can't simply cut out all of the testimonies of all the people, including all of the non um, non Brighamite testimonies. And there is contemporaneous stuff, which is to say, what does John C. Bennett have to say? So he is an enemy of Joseph Smith at a certain point, but there, it, that is all published contemporaneously as well. And it's consistent with what then uh, people who are enemies of Bennett are saying, including Brigham Young. So, you know, I, I'm sorry well, to say see, this is not the only evidence that we have. We have a preponderance of evidence that is massive and total. And so then we have to. So my my thing, what I'm saying is why, why no children? That is what given the fact that we've already shown that Joseph Smith is a polygamist, how do we explain uh, why there are no children? And so the answer is that he is not wanting to produce children. And that may be, again, part of his thinking that's going into uh, this polyandry thing. In other words, so that if there was going to be a kid that slips by, it's going to be uh, attributed to the husband that the woman's actually married to, you know. Okay, so so let me let me just add one, and I, I know we need to go, but um, the John C. Bennett thing is interesting because he gives us the initials, right? So he has LB, which is right. where we get Louisa Beeman. Louisa Beeman never claimed to have been one of Joseph's wives. I think it's important to recognize that the Brighamites absolutely had all of John C. Bennett's writings, and we have a pattern of them building a narrative on these previous rec writings. Like I said, they include the happiness letter in their own history as coming from Joseph, and John C. Bennett is the only source for that. And so the LB is interesting because that's where we get the whole story of Louisa Beeman. And now Don Bradley, who's going to come on this podcast soon, he um has discovered that that could not have happened. We, the only claim we have for Louisa Beeman is Joseph Bates Noble. And he says, you know, and, and Don Bradley has learned that his house was not built at the time that Joseph Bates Noble claims that he, and Joseph Bates Noble, who's also just like all the rest of them, his testimony is everywhere. He does not sound credible. The judge in the Temple Lock case did not find them credible in their testimonies. And so, so Louisa Beeman has, but, but now because this narrative is so strong, because the, the narrative is Joseph was a polygamist. We know that. So none of the evidence actually matters because we just twist it. So now they're just saying that actually the Louisa Beeman must have been a year or two later than we thought. So she wasn't the first wife, but really it's, I would, I mean, it's just as possible that John Bennett was making these accusations. There was no reason for him not to write the women's names. It wasn't the women who were going to sue him. It was Joseph who would have sued him. Joseph had a history of suing people and he's making the allegations against Joseph. And um, so the LB the Brighamites came up with Louisa Beeman to try to fill that in. Joseph Bates Noble was willing to say it. Louisa Beeman was already dead by the time they say that. And now we've exposed that as a lie that Joseph Bates Noble said. So all of this, that that's what I see happening is it's continually like this piece of evidence. Oh, nope, it's anal sex. This piece of evidence. Oh, no, nope, Joseph Bates Noble got the date wrong. This piece of evidence. Oh, no, it's we already know the outcome. So all of the right. evidence will be but twisted. The apolog that the, that's because the apologetic work on doing this is to go around and attack all of the whatever the each and, and do a drill down on each and every little piece that's going on. And then again, like you're saying, insisting on pro Joseph Smith in his own handwriting kind of things from his own time frame as being the, the only thing that can really be trusted because anything that goes through uh, anyway, somebody, somebody else is, is problematic. So, uh, so anyway, I appreciate you know where you're coming from and that you have done a lot of study on this but it, it it's not it 
it's not, not and none of this is convincing, you know. So the fact that yeah. if Louisa Beeman is is not on the list, it it doesn't, you know, that's not really particularly relevant, you know. So I appreciate if she is so or is. So let me ask you one final question: What pieces of evidence am I missing that I need to look at? That like you you have said, we have so much more evidence. I'm very aware of the late of the later Utah testimonies. Like what critical pieces are you like? No, we have this and we have this and we have this. Like what comes to mind? that you think is the best evidence? Because I guess I assumed you would have included what you saw as the best evidence in your presentation. So that's no. what I addressed. So no, so it's not about me like um, finding one little piece of smoking gun evidence or whatever. That's what Joseph III wanted as well. So in other words, he was willing, you know, uh, you know to do this as if, as if history is a, uh, a court case where we have to have you know, like one piece of smoking gun evidence, like let's say a genetic study so that Josephine, somebody, whatever, had actually been a, 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 a DNA uh, descendant. That's not that's not how we get to where we are in in history. You know, with the sometimes there is maybe I guess a uh, something that you want to that you would have that you know, that can't be questioned. But in any event, it what we're doing here is it's the entire preponderance of evidence, the weight of all of the testimony from all the sources that are in fact uh, biased and bigoted against each other. The fact that there is no um, way to make the counter narrative, in other words, that Brigham Young is doing this as a cabal, uh, that evidence um, is so anyway late and flimsy and so forth that that is not the that, evidence that, that isn't that a. That, in other words, so trying like, to create a different narrative. In other words, that Brigham Young is the originator of this, and that Joseph was fighting uh, polygamy, you know, during his life. Uh, you have to have a competing narrative that has um, more evidence that is all consistently waiting together, so that you can uh, to make that case. And so, unfortunately, mm -hmm. that no, I mean, again, there is a historical consensus about this because that hasn't been made, and and I don't think can be made. And so, and so it, yes, it has to be done if you want to if you want to change the consensus. Is it possible that um, that it has been done and is being done, and you're just not aware of it? Because if people aren't open to looking, if if you know, like I always say about like if we don't if we're not willing to ask the questions, we can't be given the answers. That's one thing I think about faith. When we already think we have all the answers, like the prophet can never lead us astray, we're not open to learning more. And I think that's also true with any kind of narrative, especially a historical narrative. If we are if we are so certain of the narrative that we're not willing to ask questions and be curious and look into it, how can we possibly learn more? And how can people ever learn that they were wrong? You know, like like in a way, this could be a situation where Galileo was saying, hey, look in my microscope, look at what I'm seeing about how the universe works and all of the priests saying, no, we already know this. So your piece doesn't matter that you have to look at the totality of what we know. And that's what yeah. this feels like to me. And so I'm, I'm curious, like what would need to be done to help or to allow people like yourself to to consider looking into some of this counter narrative, some of this other evidence that how, how would that I mean, it would it would take it it would take, I mean, presumably a um, somebody who is, uh, in, you know, getting their in their the PhD thesis, I guess, and who is is going to be writing, uh, you know, writing this narrative and going through, uh, you know, like all you know all of this evidence or something like that. In other words, you would so history is not static. History is constantly being. Um, it's not it's not only built on pre preceding narratives. The um, Certainly, the uh, you know the the narrative for a whole long time uh, was that uh, you know outside of the Mormon tradition. So, what was that the Solomon Spalding was the source of the Book of Mormon and so forth? That is in every early document and everything like that, and um, and that's absolutely not the case. You know, so no, you know, there's a historical consensus at this point that that is not the case. But it was it was taken outside of the tradition anyway before anybody had really done you know, uh, uh, history on it, that that was taken for, you know, uh, as gospel. And so it would have been repeated in, 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 in indeed what was, what, what um, qualifies as the early historian sources, you know, people who really didn't have access to the documents and things like that from the 19th and early 20th centuries and so forth. Um, and so, no, it would be, it would be completely possible to have new historical consensuses and, um, 
And I certainly, for example, when I was uh, doing it in more in my very precise, more, you know, like a little bit more frontline field, like I've talked about in terms of like the historical Jesus and so forth, um, I would, I'm very open, despite the fact that I'm a Christian pastor, there, it is not in fact incumbent upon me that there was a historical Jesus. That does not have to have been the case because um, you said before that you think that uh, you think that the community of Christ has betrayed Joseph the third and Emma. In fact, actually, we don't make historical claims as a church. You're talking to me in part as a historian, right? So I am a historian. I'm telling you what, in fact, the entire um, Latter-day Saint historians community and people who study the the field who are not uh, Mormon or community of Christ or or otherwise have concluded based on the preponderance of the evidence. But if a um, again, a trained historian, we're able to make the case, uh, a counter case, it is completely always possible to uh, change history, which is why I also suggested that you shouldn't be putting your faith on the sands of history. You can, history is simply one of the things that we, what we learn as an academic discipline, how we understand the past. Um, but we get confused by that very regularly in the Latter-day Saint tradition. But in fact, in Joseph III and Emma's church, we have rejected history claims as um, as being the basis of our theology. So our theology is in the the gospel and our connection to God, the restored principles of the of the restored gospel, and so forth, as opposed to um, making claims about history one way or the other. And so I have um, I have been speaking to my own people, you know, in terms of how can they uh, pastorally, how can they struggle with some things that have become identity myths based on um, how can they understand the, the historical consensus that has emerged on this. Um, and so and so it's not that there couldn't be another, um, it would just be very difficult in this particular case because uh, it's very, uh, there's so much evidence. <laughs> so, and it's okay. not, you don't have to look for anything more, but I mean, it's in other words, it's all of the different testimony that you're aware of a lot of it. And as you said, you were of lots of it. You've researched this a lot. Um, but it's not discounting, um, especially later testimony, um, including including people who are loyalist. To bring even 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 so, um, it's very difficult to produce a giant cabal that then encompasses all these people who actually hate Brigham Young as well. So. Okay. Well, I appreciate you talking to me. I, I guess I do have maybe two requests. <laughs> My hope is that in this conversation, at the very least, there can be some light shed on people who do find this um, evidence and this narrative more compelling. That uh, I, I'm hoping that there can at least be an understanding that it's not, you know, I, I mean, we always like, like in our pre pre discussion, I think you compared me, you implied flat earther and Holocaust denier yes. and, you know, I'm sorry. Yes, and I, I do did. think that's, <laughs> so. I, I, I think that's unfair. I, you know, I okay. think it's unfair to assume that we are motivated by a need, you know, that it's wishful thinking or that it's motivated reasoning or that it's anything like that other than a careful examination of the evidence. So I'm hoping that at least some room can be made in people's minds and ideally in people's discourse to allow for the fact that there are very intelligent, very honest, and very studious people who find compelling reason to think that this narrative is more likely. And in and, and whichever way you want to say that, it's, you know, I think that that's a more accurate and, and will prove to, that that's a more accurate representation that will prove to um, age better as the years go forward, as this movement continues to grow. And so that's the first thing I would ask. And then the second is, and, and you don't have to, you know, these are my requests for whatever they're worth. Yeah. The second thing is that um, we tend to set ourselves up as experts, you know, without like, I really prefer talking about the evidence. And I appreciate that you brought evidence forward in your presentation, you know, but as you said, Todd Compton was your main source. And, um, and, and there are problems with almost all of the evidence that you brought or with your interpretation of it. And so I think that we should all strive, I guess, to be more humble and circumspect in our presentation so that it's not like this is what everybody agrees with except the, you know, the flat earthers, <laughs> if that makes sense. So that's my hope is that we can recognize the limitations each of us have on our knowledge and the support for our narratives. Like I would not say that Todd Compton is an expert on this. He took the assumption that he had 
and applied it to the evidence he had and only viewed it through that lens without any investigation or questioning the narrative. And I think that that's important work to do. So I don't know what you think of that. So I disagree with that on this question. So this is not, um, I, I appreciate, uh, I'm not saying that you're having any, in any sense, uh, dishonest inquiry. Um, but, uh, this is not a, this is not a, a thing that is, uh, we, we're in a place right now where it is perfectly appropriate for historians to, um, speak of this as a settled issue. So there, we're, we can't always say that. There are lots of different uh, things in history which are very open questions where we have to say there are multiple uh, academically defensible narratives uh, to have that. And we're going back to the historical Jesus. Um, once we've agreed that the historical Jesus exists, which a couple people don't, but we essentially everybody in, who I consider to be legitimate scholars does, then there are multiple academically defensible uh, reconstructions you can make. And so Bart Ehrman says that he's a failed apocalyptic prophet. John Dominic Crossan says that he's maybe a, uh, a social reformer akin to uh, a, a, a cynic philosopher in the Greek philosophical tradition, right? And there are plenty more that can be made like that. So that's an open question. Um, but this, where we are at right now with Joseph Smith and polygamy is not an open uh, question academically and historically. And so, and so it's appropriate for historians, even when it's not their central focus, which it's not my central focus, I'll admit, I'm, I actually uh, don't care about Joseph Smith very much <laughs> myself. So I'm actually interested in the movement and I love the, the movement. I am, uh, I'm motivated by, um, you know, again, that we built, you know, when that Nauvoo and going back there and trying to build up Zion and I'm, I'm connected to it that way as a movement. Um, I'm probably the, the least Joseph Smithy Mormon historian that exists, you know, in that kind of a sense. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so that's just, I, I think that we're, we're, where we're at in this particular, in this particular place. And so I agree with you that, um, we should not, uh, I, I try to approach, I, I'm not always good, and I don't always accomplish this. I try to approach these topics pastorally and not by way of debunking. Um, my goal always for, um, I had members of my congregation who were, grew up, you know, of course, they all um, uh, thought Brigham Young created polygamy and so forth, and, and, and account, you know, uh, the historical narrative when they ha actually hear it, as opposed to our uh, inherited identity uh uh, sacred story is is rough, and so what I and so again I what I'm always trying to do whenever I'm talking about that or or telling talking about different parts of the gospels that aren't historical or something like that is is to say we shouldn't be so focused on history in the first place and rather we should when we when when we do find out about these historical things we, these should these should enrich our understanding of the movement that we're coming from and our background and our history and so that's that's what I want to do and I and I and so I. Uh, and so I, I apologize for oh, I, the flippant um, examples that I was using in terms of because I was trying I was actually going to try to come up with a hypothetical one so because anytime you mention Nazis it's you've you've lost the argument so Holocaust and so yes I'm not calling this a <laughs> shouldn't mention that you know in other words there are Holocaust deniers there's a historical consensus that the Holocaust happened but there are people who have it at best on belief. Uh, and they, in a lot of cases, think that they have evidence or whatever. That's not relevant because I'm not going to make that comparison. <laughs> but because it's not, it's not nice and fair, and, and you lose the bat, in, in, any any you you lose any sense of being remotely pastoral. So what I would just say is I um, appreciate also the c conversation that we've had. I appreciate how much research you've done. You have a lot of information at your fingertips. It's really amazing, and I and I really appreciate that. And I also appreciate that um, you've come to this place. With honesty and integrity, and um, and like I say, it's not that um, history is ever done, and, and and indeed, at the end of the day, um, anything that's been written about history now will have to be entirely rewritten three or four generations because the things that people there it has to be translated for a time and place, and the and the interests that they have, you know, uh, 80 years ago um, when history was written totally differently because nobody cared about 
I'm not specifically mean about it, but the historians didn't care about women's perspectives. <laughs> now right, we, right. Or, or regular people. In other words, they only cared about political leaders. And so it would only be about the very much elite and what they were doing and so forth. Now we care a lot, I think. I care a lot. And so I've been part of I the revolution too. of historians who is trying to see how is this affecting the regular people? I'm not worried only about Joseph Smith. What was happening to everybody else, you know? And so, and so, um, and so, well, and so that's where we are with history and, it, and it's ever moving forward. But um, I guess my, my, my plea as a pastor who is also a historian is that we work on separating out our faith from our worrying about history. And um, my positions on history, people in, my church don't have to agree with me because we're not a history club. Um, and so, and so what I would just say is this church hasn't abandoned Joseph the third and Emma. <laughs> and so, okay. and, and, uh, and despite that. my, um, my, my position is as a historian and it isn't in any way, I've got their picture on the wall here, right? So it is not, I am not, um, um, attempting to denigrate them in any way. I understand that they were people who went through a lot. What Emma had to go through, you know, I, I, and I, I'm, uh, there are people who aren't big fans of her, like William Law, but I'm a big fan and I, and I, I'm and I fan. very much appreciate her. And I think that, um, her son is, uh, among the most, um, successful and, uh, admirable, uh, figures that the restoration has ever produced, you know, so. John, I cannot thank you enough for this conversation. I really appreciate just engaging with honesty and integrity and willingness to answer the hard questions. Can you tell us where people can find you? Where do we find your broadcast and how do we engage sure. with people that would like to join your congregation? What information can you give us? So the easiest way to find everything that I'm doing um, is to go to our website for, for the congregation is uh, center place, but spelled the Canadian way. So C E N T R E place.ca. And one of the things you'll find there is uh, you go to center place slash lectures or just hit the lectures button. And I have um, talked hundreds of hours on yes, restoration topics, but also understanding all of um, Western history and in, in, in indeed uh, Christianity but from the grounding of a, a restoration pastor. So I don't only see the time period of the last two centuries that we've had as a, as a restored church as being our only inheritance. How, how does the entire rest of the Christian tradition and everything else that went before it inform who we are um, as Latter-day Saints now in the 21st century? And so uh, I, hopefully that will be of interest to uh, people that you are also listening to your pad, podcast. And I am so sorry that um, I'm expressing a contrary in position <laughs> that, 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 that uh, I think a lot of the folks that, who listen to you maybe not like, and, uh, and, 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 and I probably also did so in a way that was very unconvincing. Uh, but in any event, I, I, no, I apologize I for that. Valuable. <laughs> I'm just going to consider where the, I'm going to start calling us the Galileo club and we will just wait until we're allowed to come out of house arrest. <laughs> so that's my okay. prediction. But thank you, John. <laughs> Have a great day. I want to again very sincerely thank John for giving me so much of his time, for being willing to come on and be um, pushed with difficult questions and, and be willing to engage so um, agreeably and honestly and vulnerably with someone who disagrees with him. So I really appreciate that. I'm hoping that we can have more of these types of conversations on this topic, but in society in general, I really appreciate being able to engage with somebody who is willing to engage, even though we don't see eye to eye. So thank you again, John, and thank you for the, to the rest of you for being here and sticking with us. And I will see you next time. <laughs>